Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <clears throat> good morning. It's a pleasure to see all of you back this morning. I hope that you enjoyed the trip on the boat last night. It was a lovely evening. The food was excellent. The company was even better. Um, I, it was interesting, actually, whenever you have these, these tours on the, on the lake, um, we go next to all these lovely villas, we go next to all these historic buildings, but we end up spending all our time looking in and talking to ourselves and talking within our group. But it was a very, very nice evening. Um, yesterday, we had a very, very full day. Yesterday, we were talking in the morning about future fuels, and so some very interesting discussions. We had the panel discussion that was moderated by Charles, and then we moved over to alternative propulsion systems. Um, we heard about nuclear options. We had a panel discussion talking about electric ships. And then in the afternoon, we moved on to looking at finishing up, actually, with that discussion between MSC and Shell, which was very interesting, talking about their views on decarbonization, the challenges, but also the opportunities, and also the partnership between the two companies. And I thought it was very, very positive that the two such large companies are working together to try and solve this and not just working in their own fields on their own. So today we have a busy day again, and so in the morning we're gonna be talking about new technologies for better efficiency, and very, very important for the industry as a whole. And then this afternoon we're gonna be talking about compliance and legislation. Now we heard an awful lot yesterday that legislation, regulations, that's going to be a very important part of the future. It's a little bit unknown, but it'd be very good to see how that works out going forward. So right now, we are very, very lucky to have with us from MSC, Mr. Andre Sima, um, who is the Global Chief Digital and Information Officer, and he's going to talk to us about digitization in shipping. So if Andre can join me on the stage, it, we'd be very, very interested to hear about what you have to say. Thank you, Andre. Please join me in welcoming Andre. Thank you, Richard. Good morning. That was not my piece. <laughs> but don't you just love a bit of music um, in the morning to wake you up? I'm not going to talk about sustainability. Um, the organizers wanted something a bit different. So uh, different is me. And yes, I am a musician. I play bass and guitar. I tried to get my band in, but they said, no, no, this is a very serious conference. So, uh, and I started very early, and that's not a wig, that is me, in the days. And you know, I wonder what would happen if we actually had a pile of instruments uh, on stage or in the room, and everyone in the room grabbed one and started to play. It would probably sound a bit like this. just doing their own, uh, their own thing. So welcome to the magical world of uh, digital in the shipping industry. And this is what I want to talk about. Um, in our industry, we've historically had a big problem or several problems. Everyone's using different instruments and trying to play the same song. So we're not acting in a very harmonized way. Now, let's consider um, something we do every day, shipping cargo across the world. Pretty easy. Around 100,000 commercial ships are moving around the globe, transporting something like 11 billion tons of goods, and from one continent to the other. And keeping all that in sync, or afloat, if I can use that expression, uh, requires a very intricate and a highly advanced communication system. And if we think about it, there's three different perspectives I'd like to, to talk about today. So um, the first one is the customer's perspective. Let's talk about our direct customers. As carriers, our customers may be from the industry, but they may also be a freight forwarder or anyone that wants to ship a container from A to B. Pretty simple. 
Now, our customers simply want to know where the cargo is, that it's safe and secure, and that it will arrive on time in the, in the estimates that we've, uh, we've provided to them. And they want this, of course, on their computers, on the mobile phone, but I was going to show this, but it's not a phone, um, as part of the usual service. So nothing, nothing uh, very, very um, different from, from what they do in other lines of, uh, of their day-to-day -day work. So in other words, they want all the relevant information to be connected with real-time monitoring, end-to-end -end from the factory or the plant to the shelves of the shop. Now, um, <coughs> if we look at it from a tech supplier perspective, and by the way, today, um, I'm not gonna ask for a minute of silence, but it is the 10th anniversary of Steve Jobs' uh, passing, so, uh, and, and this was absolutely not coordinated, this was in my deck before. But anyway, if we look at it from the tech supplier's perspective, lots of tech suppliers and startups are trying to fix all these problems that, uh, that, uh, that we have. And some have great tech and ideas, but they're very often limited to one small portion of um, the problem of the chain, let's say. And they're struggling with the complexity, the scale, and the diversity of our industry. Now, if you look at it from our perspective, from the carriers, while the customer requests sound pretty simple, we just want to know where the cargo is, we want to make sure it's safe, we want to know if it's arriving on time, um, they're often, they, they don't realize that what they're asking for is very complex. And it's actually extremely complicated in many cases. First, there's thousands and thousands of different uh, transport providers, whether it's you know, trucks, rail, feeder, and so on. And as a matter of fact, with the current situation, as you probably know, big retailers are chartering their own ships. And this adds to the complexity of the, of the supply chain. On top of this, there are thousands of terminals, ports, warehouses, depots, rail ramps, and other bits and pieces in the supply chain infrastructure. And if it wasn't enough, there are hundreds of regulatory bodies, regulatory requirements, by country, by industry, by activity, so it's really extremely, extremely complex. And when we look at our day-to-day -day work as a, as a shipping line, we have tens of thousands of different connections with different bodies, uh, and of course, we don't always speak the same language. So from a digital standpoint, this situation actually creates thousands of systems operating independently. And we have hardware differences, software differences, variations in terminology, languages, and regulatory. So back to the music analogy, if each player has a different instrument and a different sheet of music um, written in a different format, how can we play together? I don't know if there's musicians in the room, but you probably get my, my drift. Personally, I can't read music. Uh, I play from ear, and that maybe helps a little bit with, um, with you know, being able to play with other people. So, you know, if we're the only carrier from A to B, we can usually answer the customer questions and we can try to provide the information that they need. But when the cargo leaves our hands, we have to start making calls, sending emails, WhatsApp messages when it works, um, and get the information for the customer. So maybe somebody actually needs to go physically identify the container and then report back. So these manual processes can be very, very messy, and they're certainly extremely inefficient. Now, from all three perspectives, and this is, you can see the maze here, customers, tech suppliers, carriers, the problem is really one of diversity and of scale. So we all seem to be lost in this maze, um, and we don't know how to find each other. And we've had this problem for a very long time. And we know that we're behind other industries, and hence my talk this morning. So within MSC, we're trying to make our business more modern and more digital, whether it's you know, converting legacy systems um, or building interfaces with the, with the legacy systems to other systems so they can talk to one another and provide customers the information that they need. And of course, I keep on saying customers because we are customer-centric, but it also works internally, obviously, and it has to work internally before we can serve the, the outside world. One example, I thought this was a good, a good example to show, is the smart container. 
and I was talking to Chris this morning about smart containers. Um, so let's take an example. This little box, um, no specific brand, monitors the position, the movement, uh, the temperatures, the shocks, and so on, and reports information back to, to a central place. Now, if that information is integrated with data coming from the shipping lines, then the result can be meaningful. So if you look at this, and I'm not going to describe it, but the screen is big enough so you can see some of the steps that we have to go through. Um, you see the simple example of moving goods in containers and who are the actors that are, that are involved here. So a smart container will report cargo status throughout the shipping process. And indeed, if there are shocks or variations in temperature, humidity, depending on the kind of goods that are carried, this is extremely um, valuable information. But more importantly, it shows exceptions. And I think that's where we need to focus because that's what will allow the supply chain to react. And we did this for this project by creating internal standards and aligning digitally. Now, I can go on forever on the smart containers, but just think about it. It's, it's very nice to have a container reporting information. And you, know, you can put that on the map with the intended um, uh, shipment routes and, and trucking and what have you. But if you want valuable data, you also need to communicate on board ships. And for anybody who's involved in ships, I'm sure there's a lot of people here, you will know that there are no standards to that effect. So here again, if we want to make value out of this information, then you need to have um, these standards being defined and of course being adopted. Now, beyond MSC, the problem is much more complex. The scale and the diversity of the industry, as you know, um, often feels unsurmountable. And sometimes I wake up in the morning, I think, gee, what are we going to focus on today? So let's look at the to-do list. And, and a lot of the to-do items are still there because it takes time. And there's just so many pieces in that puzzle. Um, and they're all over the world. So what do we do? So what we're doing now is trying to pull together uh, some of the pieces of the puzzle and create industry standards. This is not something um, new. This has been going on for a couple of years now. But we believe that by creating these standards, by harmonizing the way we talk to each other, everything from you know location codes, who's into location codes? Somebody from the UN? No. Um, to regulatory definitions, not to mention API standards. You know, API is the is um, is just a new denomination for something we've been doing for years. But in tech, we like to uh, bring new words and. Um, the idea is that all the carriers could play off the same uh, sheet of music. And that's not just an idea. It started. It's happening now. And it's called interoperability. I think there's a slide that defines it. So we need standards to deal with interoperability issues. You know, I'll check at the coffee break that everybody can say this word interoperability. I had to learn it actually. Uh, in, in um, Mandarin one day as I was presenting back in, uh, uh, in 2019. But this is a very, very important word that I think you need to remember. So I'll let you read the, the Wikipedia definition. Not very interesting, but what it means is that if you don't have this, then it's very difficult to share information across a network and particularly uh, in the supply chain. And we need standards to enable the introduction of technologies like the Internet of Things, IoT, and uh, the blockchain. Mobile phones work around the world. So for the older generation, in the, in the early days of mobile phones, when you went to the US, you had to have a second phone. You could put your Swiss SIM card, but you needed another phone because they weren't using the same bands. So this is an industry where they decided very early to adopt standards for networks, for phones, and for applications. And this was done by the key players, at the time very few, uh, deciding on standards together. And before these standards, we had to change phones or change SIM cards when we visited different countries. So I think this is an easy, um, easy to understand comparison. The airlines also face this problem, but with a degree of collaboration, a lot of things that annoyed customers were resolved. For example, uh, it, it's not by coincidence that you know when you're going to Geneva, 
it says GVA on, on, your, on your boarding pass. Uh, I remember uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I was getting uh, a visit from a Korean company and um, I was waiting for the chap in the office and the phone rings and they say, look, can I, can I pass you the taxi driver? They, he doesn't know where your office is. I said, sure. So I put the guy on the phone and the guy speaking Italian and I luckily, and because I work for an Italian company, I could understand him. And I said, you know, where are you? Well, he says, I'm at the airport. I said, okay, so why don't you just, you know, come to the office? It's in the center of the city. And he says, but, but I'm in Genoa. I said, what do you mean you're in Genoa? Anyway, so the poor guy booked the flight and ended up in Genoa instead of Geneva. <laughs> so, so he didn't look at his boarding pass. It's true, it's a true story. So we see that uh, there's been progress there. Now, what we did to try to solve that in 2019, we got together with some of the, um, some of the other carriers and we created DCSA, Digital Container Shipping Association, as difficult to pronounce as interoperability, but you get used to it. And what we did is we wanted to create a neutral, non-profit group founded, founded and funded uh, by the carriers to digitize and standardize the container shipping industry. So it sounds very easy. You think, oh yeah, that's cool. Well, I'm sure that works and, and everybody's adopting all the standards. Well, not so easy, but what we've managed to do is to work with a lot of companies across, um, across the different standard bodies, the, the shippers, freight forwarders, solution providers, logistic participants, and try to work together and collaborate to make those standards become um, a reality. Um, and even during the pandemic, we didn't stop working. I haven't been actually to DCSA for nearly two years, um, but we continued to progress in the standard definition and uh, work with many industry stakeholders to drive, to drive the change. And we, it's second slide with Chief Jobs, it's pure coincidence. So we believe that a standards-based approach benefits everyone. From the perspective of technology suppliers, they can create products that will work for all of us and all the others industry, in the industry. So I think this is a very, very important factor for the, for the tech suppliers. And from the customer perspective, they can get more products from the technology suppliers with hopefully in the future integrated digital information. From the carrier's uh, perspective, because I, I don't want to forget that, we also need to become more efficient and we want to benefit by connecting to our customers and the other actors in the shipping process. Remember all the, all the different bodies we have to connect to um, and all the information that has to flow throughout the process. And to do that, we're investing a lot of time. Uh, I know I am and my teams are every, every single day uh, and money, of course, to bring the industry forward. And we need everybody to understand this point as we move forward together. I believe this was um, yesterday, and maybe you're not a carrier, um, and you're wondering how you fit in, and you know, you're thinking, what about me? Um, do you want my opinion? And of course we want your opinion. We want your input, we want your ideas, and your suggestions, and I encourage you to visit dcsa.org even if you're in a, different, in a different line of business, just to see how we've structured the projects and where we're putting the focus, because it has an influence on all the actors in, in this industry. Look at the standards published and feel free to sign up. Um, it's all free, so, so go ahead. And finally, why are we doing this? Um, well, we're doing this because we believe in solving the problem together in a, in a collaborative mode and that will a eventually be able to advance into the future and one day play some good music together. That was my presentation just to, to wake you up after I heard you had a nice evening yesterday. And these are my contact details. Feel free to um, ping me on um, whichever uh, network works. Hopefully there won't be any more interruptions today on, on social media. Thank you very much and I wish you a very good conference. Thank you, Chris. Some questions? Ah. See, the thing is your timer says 20 minutes, so I could be here until tomorrow. That's all right. It hasn't um, started. Sure. Are there any questions that I can answer? Please don't ask me about sustainability.
Do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, we do have a question straight away here. Um, we're just getting a microphone for you. Um, I think it's fantastic everything you're working on at the moment. I think it's so important to the industry, and I've been using containers for 20 years, and I remember the first 10 years or so we used to have to ask the shipping line for all the information. We didn't have access to anything ourselves. Question here. Yes, um, hello, this is Michael Ott speaking. Um, um, you've set up a standard uh, for this, this uh, uh, data interoperability, but um, working with these, these uh, you're all so strong competitors of each other, so how did you overcome that problem of uh, probably each party wanting, wanting to use their own, let's say, system that they already use? Did that go in harmony or was there any other method that, that you used for that? Well, actually, it was it, it, that was the easy part. That was the easy part. Um, you know, if you, I've been in this industry for a long time, and of course, we, we know each other in, in with the other carriers, and we've often had dialogues um, uh, pertaining to to systems because I don't believe that we should be competing on technology. So we managed to agree on that with uh, two of the of the major uh, carriers. And then we went to the others. We always talked to the CIO or the CDO. We, we didn't go to the CEO level because we know that that's a bit uh, uh, more complex. And, um, and we got together one day and we said, okay, let's spend two days together and see if we can make this work uh, with a collaborative approach. And it did work because in our line of business, we were not competing against each other. Of course, there's all the regulatory and uh, uh, compliance side of things that, that we have to deal with. But yeah, it's worked very nicely. Now we just need adoption. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We have one question that's come up on Slido, and I think it's actually the first question of the conference where the person's actually put their name. Um, so Jan has asked how... I knew it was Jan before even seeing his <laughs> name. <laughs> it's easy to guess. How important is it for DCSA to have membership from China? That's a good question. Now I'm thinking. Um, no, I think that if you, w we believe that um, even if we don't have um, membership from China, which, which I believe we will have very soon, but even if we don't, I think we have sufficient um, strength, let's say, to, to lead and to provide those standards. And I believe that China, like any other country, uh, should be happy to have that, um, as it will also help them, you know, with their own projects, their own uh, uh, digital platforms like GSBN. So I'm pretty confident it will happen. Sorry, um, just uh, trying to sort some technical issues. Um, next question that's come up, and so now we actually, people are putting their name to their questions. Um, could you give us an example how data could reduce CO2 emissions? Well, that's pretty easy, actually. There's, there's many things. Um, data centers. So now we use the cloud. So people think the cloud isn't a data center. So, so it doesn't change much, actually. It's just somebody else's data center. No, I think that if you look at the, an easy one is the mass of paper. The mass of paper that goes around the industry. And one of the w things we're working on today is standardizing some of the documentation, like the, the, the bill of lading that I, I often d um, propose as a, as a hot topic. So I think that that will certainly help reduce, um, have the effect of reducing by reducing the paper, by reducing the amount of work, the keying in that has to happen. And then, of course, you know, it just goes on and on and on. I'm not talking specifically about, uh, about ships themselves, but I'm talking about all the work that happens um, to, to make the supply chain, uh, you know, be more efficient. Uh, another one, just a very quick question from myself. I mean, it's, this is uh, certainly e-bills of lading. Um, electronic bills of lading are something we've been discussing. I've been in the industry for 20 years. We've been discussing them for at least 20 years, probably a lot longer since than, than when I joined the industry. Um, do you think that they might become widely used in the near future? I do. I'm actually convinced. If I wasn't convinced, we, we wouldn't have launched our own uh, our own product. And We've been followed by other carriers uh, in, the, in, the, in the recent weeks, and I think this is a good, good show of... Um, it will happen. It, it is happening, slowly but surely. Um, but I think it will probably accelerate once we manage to transform other documents. Because, you know, if you, take, if you take a pile of documents for shipment, the bill of lading is one of them. I think the, the pandemic has helped to, to accelerate that because people couldn't move 
uh, paper around. So I'm pretty confident. I think in the next couple of years, um, uh, we, should, we should see some, some progress on the, I hope, on the whole documentation chain, not just the bill of lading. The bill of lading is tricky because it's, you know, you have to deal with governments and banks and, uh, but yeah, we're seeing positive progress. And 200 years of jurisprudence. Which yeah, that as well. But I never say bad things about the legal side of the, mm. of the business. Makes sense. Just um, in case. Are there any more questions? Um, I think on that note, could you please join me saying a massive thank you to Andre thank Sima. You. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> thank you. So I think that there's an awful lot to be done in digitization in the world of shipping and certainly when I started working in shipping it was very difficult to get any kind of information out and now suddenly we have a lot more access to information. So now we're going to move on and we are going to be listening to Mehmed Uzel from Cavotech. He's going to be talking to us about reducing ship emissions at port through automated mooring and shore power. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Hello, my name is Mehmed Uzel. Um, I'm the chief commercial officer for a company called Cavotech. And I'm here to show you some technologies that aren't entirely new, um, but they are now connected and how they could help reduce ship emissions um, while cruising, but also at the port. Okay, so uh, we are a, a, a leading clean tech company we, and we provide connection and electrification solutions to enable the decarbonization of ports and industrial applications. Uh, we are not a new company. We've been around for about 40 years. In fact, when it comes to shore power, we'd like to claim that we've invented shore power in the 80s with cable management solutions uh, that have come forward to today with uh, IoT-enabled solutions. Every solution you see on the screen are IoT enabled. And as Andre uh, rightfully said uh, in the earlier presentation, uh, we do solve parts of the problem, but a crucial part of the problem in, uh, in every application. Um, to measure up to, uh, to, to the wonderful presentation before me, I've cheated. I've brought a lot of cool videos for you. Uh, but before I show you those videos, I'd like to say a few words about each and every uh, product that is relevant for today's conversation. The first one is automated mooring. This is a 20-year-old technology and we've launched the next generation of automated mooring this year. It is a vacuum-based mooring technology. It does not require any modification to the ship. Um, and the real benefit for shipping lines is slow steaming. Again, slow steaming is just going slower. Maybe you've experienced, experienced this with your car. Try to drive even on the highway from A to B twice, once at 100 kilometers an hour and once at 120 kilometers an hour. You will immediately see about 20, 25, sometimes even 30% of uh, fuel savings. And, um, but then you're gonna say, well, okay, but I, I get there a little bit later, right? I'm gonna lose time. Well. Automated mooring can moor a container ship in as little as 30 seconds. Okay, so if I were to tell you that at A and at B, I would be able to save time with automated mooring, then you could absolutely slow steam with any vessel between A and B. The second thing, uh, product on the screen that I'd like to talk to you about is shore power. Again, you're going to say, what is new about shore power? We're all aware um, some of the regulations are uh, coming our way uh, to not only uh, enable all kinds of ships to receive shore power at port, but also for ports to provide shore power to ships. Um, so I will show you some of our solutions in, in shore power, not only in traditional shore power, but we also uh, provide e-vessel charging um, I was just in Norway last week in, in Oslo uh, to see our automated plug-in system charging an entirely electric uh, ferry 
um, at about six megawatts. So if anybody's interested in, in talking about that, I'd love to talk to you at uh, coffee break. Um, we also convert uh, container ships to receive shore power. Uh, and, and our customers tend to be, well, just about all of the shipping lines. Um, the last, uh, well, we talked about e-vessels. The last thing I want to show you is uh, crane electrification. We won't talk about that today, not in my presentation, but we do provide electrification for uh, cranes on the port side. Uh, ERTGs uh, would be one application. Uh, and let's go on to the movie. Every minute matters when you are keeping the world moving. Manual mooring is slow and dangerous, with risks from ropes under tension and hard manual labor close to the water's edge. Moor Master NXG changes that with rope-free, remotely operated vacuum mooring at the push of a button. Faster mooring means less use of thrusters and tugs, reducing harmful emissions for port employees and nearby communities. More Master also reduces vessel motion for higher loading and offloading productivity, faster vessel throughput, and increased safety. In the maritime supply chain, every minute saved equals improved energy efficiency. Faster turnarounds in port also allows vessels to cruise more slowly to their next port of call, saving fuel and reducing the environmental footprint on every trip. More Master NXG is designed for easy integration into existing terminals. The significantly slimmer footprint requires 40% less depth on the key compared to existing models. Our two-step installation process allows installation to take place between calling vessels to be up and running in less time than ever, with maintained productivity. Every aspect of the new More Master NXG has been designed for ease of use. Dozens of smart sensors measure all key variables for remote monitoring, as well as predictive maintenance. Further, Cavotech's industrial IoT platform uses artificial intelligence to learn from every more master system on Earth and puts the insights to work for your system. Every year more master is installed on your berth, the system will get better at delivering unrivaled vessel control increasing system lifetime and decreasing cost of ownership. The second more master system ever was installed in 2003 for Sea Road and it's still going strong decades later. Sea Road's business is growing and they're introducing a new larger vessel and upgrading the current more master system with new next generation units. It's been a long journey with the more master systems and Cavatech 17 years. I can say they've been extremely consistent over the time and Cavatech's support for the system has been exemplary. It's time to rediscover vacuum mooring with more Master NXG. Every minute matters. Okay, um, with that, I'd like to switch over the discussion to shore power. So obviously, more Master is uh, quite an advanced technology that allows uh, slow steaming between A and B, as we discussed before, uh, but uh, it also provides benefits in terms of increased safety for workers at the port, but also in uh, stabilizing the ship for faster cargo unload and load. Um, now on to shore power. Shore power is, again, perhaps not a new technology. Surely it's been advanced over the last uh, 40 years uh, to, to the current state. It's uh, highly connected. Uh, they, um, the, the systems that we provide are highly uh, designed to be in public spaces, like Port of Valletta in Malta. Um, but it is a technology that exists. And, and we don't necessarily have to wait for regulations to impose using shore power. And we can be on the right side of history by uh, doing the right thing, like Port of Valletta in this example. Port of Valletta's um, goal is to reduce ship emissions by 90%. And if you can uh, imagine that uh, every year there's about 1 million 
tourists that uh, go through Port of Valletta. So it is absolutely important for them to reduce ship emissions at the port, the cruise ship emissions in this case. Okay, and now I have another movie for you. Now is the time to take charge. To take charge of emissions, noise and pollution. To not wait for regulations to be imposed. To reclaim every port as the welcoming hearts of our communities. To transform negative perceptions into positive actions. To drive the change that puts us on the right side of history. Take charge with the people who invented shore power, who have equipped thousands of vessels and hundreds of ports, who have 40 years experience delivering the widest range of solutions, from the simplest upgrade to the most complex installation. Take charge with a partner you can trust on every step of the journey. Take charge with Shaw Power from Cavotech. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I hope you enjoyed the, the movies, first of all, um, and, and I'd, I'd love to take your questions after the conclusions. Um, I, I think we need to act now. I'm convinced we need to act now. There is no reason why um, a, a container ship should not be equipped to receive shore power at the port. Um, obviously, for the more massive case, we're talking about a significant investment, but there are also significant advantages for the port and for the shipping lines of being able to uh, not only steam slower, but also save emissions at the port. A more massive unit uh, system, rather, in Port of Helsinki is saving today eight thousand tons of fuel at the port and this is based on a calculation uh, we worked on with a company called DNVGL um, so uh, more master can save tens of thousands in some cases of, uh, of tons of fuel per year add shore power on top so that during the duration of the ship at birth there is no emissions from the ship and they use main electricity from the port then you're talking very serious ship emissions at the port in addition to saving fuel while steaming. Integrated mooring and charging is another topic that we talked about earlier in the presentation, especially for e-vessel charging. Um, their uh, automated plug-in systems obviously maximizes charging time. Uh, for uh, the engineers among us, uh, we're talking about five megawatts to six megawatts of charging today, and that will only increase with time. Therefore, if you can connect the charging equipment to the e-vessel quickly, then you're saving minutes and minutes of, of charging, which is invaluable for the e-vessel operator. Uh, Cavotech is the total solution provider. We don't just provide the connection, but we do uh, install and commission all of our equipment. Uh, so we do provide an end-to-end -end solution. So if you'd like to uh, get in touch with Cavotech, I'll be around at the coffee break, uh, or uh, as always, you can visit uh, cavotech.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, extremely interesting. Um, does anybody have any questions on that presentation on the subject of the automated mooring? Um, if you don't mind, I just have a quick question on, on the mooring. Um, obviously, when a vessel goes into a port, it's loading or discharging, and so there's quite a significant shift in the draft of the vessel. Does this, is it built into the system, or does it require it to attach and detach when the draft is changing by as much as, as five, six meters? Uh, no, it is, uh, that's a very good question, and, and I uh, perhaps forgot to mention that it is a dynamic system. Uh, therefore, it, it moves with the ship and with the tide, and it stabilizes the ship depending on uh, sea conditions. Uh, obviously, around the world, we have different sea conditions depending on where the port is, so we have different systems that are adapted to that. 
Uh, Port of Salala in Oman is a good example uh, where there's long waves. So we do use a very heavy duty version of the Moormaster, where for, uh, if, if we're talking about uh, easier weather conditions, then we have lighter units that can handle it. But all of our units are dynamic. They adapt to the weather conditions and, and the tide. Excellent. Um, in fact, would you have a question to just come up on the screen uh, while we were, you were giving that answer? Do you offer any solutions for ports that cannot electrify some of their docks? Big yes. Uh, this is a pr problem, uh, obviously, especially when it comes to uh, cruise ships that require quite a lot of uh, energy uh, to electrify a, a ship at the port. Uh, we are working with partners to uh, potentially even produce the uh, electricity at the port. Uh, now, you can also use a combination of renewable energies produced at the port and batteries to store some of that energy to uh, provide peak shaving. So we are partnering with a couple um, suppliers to provide an end-to-end -end solution for ports that cannot electrify otherwise. Uh, it seems like um, we've got the question started now. So um, going on to the next question, do you, how do you plug the system to the ship? So, so the ship has to be converted, whether it's an uh, existing ship or uh, a new build. Uh, so we do provide the ship conversion. It's a containerized solution for container ships um, that we simply put on the ship and convert while the ship is cruising so that we don't lose time. Uh, we have one of these projects about to kick off right now. So the conversion will actually take place while the ship is uh, en route. Uh, so yeah, the, every traditional ship to receive shore power, every traditional ship needs to be converted. Excellent. Um, I'm actually going to give preference because I, I tend to give preference for questions from somebody, uh, from a named person. Um, so Sue has asked, your system is available from which ship size? What is the smallest size you can address? Um, um, that, that's a question, I'm, uh, a very good question. I'm not sure I, I'm able to answer, but I'll give a generic answer. Uh, talking about the Moore Master, uh, we have units that are uh, adaptable for medium-sized ferries, down to about that size, uh, medium and, and maybe even some of the small ferries, but of course it depends on the hull of the ship. We do need enough uh, flat surface area on the side of the ship to attach the Moore Master, uh, but when it comes to shore power, the size is irrelevant really. Excellent. And the last question, um, I mean, with all the different systems around the world, any standardization in sight? Uh, that one I won't be able to answer, unfortunately. I'm uh, only a marketing guy. But uh, uh, so there are some talks uh, we are having with international standards organizations. Uh, but at this point, I'm not aware of, uh, of any. Um, when it comes to cycles and voltage and plugs. Uh, right now, the every, for instance, I'm talking about e-ferries here. Every e-ferry connection plug is custom for that application for the time being. But of course, in the future, that could be standardized. Just It's just not there today. Excellent. Well, you've already given very good answers to the other questions. And uh, for a marketing guy, you've certainly sold me on the, the need for these different technologies. Um, could you please all join me in thanking I'm ready for the presentation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. And so now we're moving on, and um, we're talking about the potential for digital fleet management um, from the classification society Rena. We have Michaela Shenon, who's going to give a presentation. Please. Hello, everybody. So I'm Michela Schenone. I'm a Marine Digital Advisory Solutions Manager as RENA. And as a background, I'm a naval architect and marine engineer. So in these days, we've been talking about decarbonization and what we should do to reach the targets, the ambitious targets that are set up for the future. We've been talking about new fuels, technological improvements, and Another point on which we could actually act a bit quicker rather than on the other two is to improve the operational measures. So in this part, digital could be an important partner. So the fleet performance management 
and that digitalization can help improving the efficiency of the vessels, monitoring the efficiency, and also ensuring, of course, the compliance with the new regulations, together with ensuring that the technological improvements that have been applied to the vessel are actually improving and maintaining the efficiency of the, of the vessel. So what we see in digital fleet management? So we see a solution that helps monitor and manage from shore side the different aspects of a vessel. So we've seen now with COVID, everybody started working remotely, connected through technology. So we all evaluated the benefits that being connected through digital can give and provide to all of us. Why, this cannot, why shouldn't this provide a good benefit, a real benefit, also connecting the vessels with the shore side, improving the operations, helping the vessels improving their operation. So human experience may not be sufficient anymore. The masters and the crew on board has so many systems to control, to manage and to care about. So assistance from shore side and new digital tools installed on board can actually help them improve their job. So I'm thinking about, for example, the remote inspections that had a real boost in this period, or electronic logbooks that help to reduce the burden on, boat, on board for the, for the cruise side, and the streaming the information to shore actually help the shore side be aware of what's happening on board. Of course, with digital, we also have some tools that can be used to optimize the operations of the vessels, create good plannings, and actually monitor the main efficiency KPIs that should be, of course, well-defined. So in general, we see flexible and future-proof digital platforms that can follow the technological improvements and help with the upcoming regulations. So as an example, we've actually been working for almost a decade with MSC Cyprus. Uh, in order to cope with the salt for cap, we actually did a huge scrubber installation. So they had different providers connect and installing the scrubbers on the vessels. They asked us to have the possibility to remotely check what was going on their vessels, how the scrubbers were operated. So we interfaced the different systems independently from the providers. We studied the mimics, the tag list, and we reproduced them on shore side creating also alerts in order to ensure the compliance, and so on. So with digital platform, it's actually easy to adapt to future changes. The platform I was talking about referring to MSC Cyprus is actually our optimum tool, which is a modular digital solution to ease the fleet performance management. And again, as I said, to, it's made to overcome the of course, upcoming decarbonization challenges. So the main parts of this platform are a part to monitor in real time the information, analyze the information that has been collected, optimize it, so optimize the um, operations of the vessels based on the data collected, and of course, through this, reach the decarbonization targets. So how is the system created? So we truly believe on data collection on board. So it's important to have good and reliable data. It's important to connect the different systems, put the information together and enrich them with manual inputs where the information cannot come from sensors or with external information such as uh, weather information. Then on this data, we can build efficiency KPIs with the machine learning techniques or traditional methods, and we can real-time monitor the efficiency of the ship in order to understand if the ship is still efficient or not. I'm thinking, for example, about the future CII. If we have to, a vessel that suddenly is not in the range anymore. So through this system, we could receive information, analyze it, and promptly act. Of course, with the last part, with the analytics, we actually work with big data. We stream to shore one data point every five minutes. 
and uh, we give tools to support dry dock planning, so understand, based on the real information, when the vessel needs a dry dock. Analyze intervention, so ensure that the technological improvements, that the energy efficiency improvement applied to the vessels are really uh, improving the efficiency, and of course, cover the status of the EOI, CII, and all the indexes related to decarbonization. This is an example of an analysis that was done by us as a third party. So we actually certify the gains from interventions, and uh, we had the opportunity, this is a Raro Pax vessel, you see on the x-axis we have the speed, while on the y-axis we have the power. On the left side, it's the result of the analysis done on noon reporting data. So the company provided the reports, we filtered them, we applied the contractual conditions, but here is really not understandable the gain that they had with the refitting. So they did a, a reblading. On the other side, it's very easy to see how the two data sets are apart. It's easy to understand that the ship is actually sailing in a more efficient way now. So now that we have to also provide data to the outside, it's important to know what we're doing and to do it on reliable information. So this is just one of the dedicated uh, uh, sections of the tool where it's already built in the possibility to analyze a, an intervention and evaluate it. When you have good data, of course, you can also easily understand the payback of an intervention and how much CO2, in this case, you're saving. So in this case, we uh, analyze the most common speed on which when the contract was made as well, which is about 21 knots. And we actually evaluated the gain after the intervention, and with this data, we could go back to the customer and show them that they had a real saving. As I said, data are not just used internally nowadays. We have to communicate them outside. We started, for example, with MRV, which has a public database. So the information from ships were exposed to the world. And now we also have to show to the society how our huge investments in the market are actually having a good impact on it. So it's important to have the information to show them outside and have a reliable outcome of the interventions that are done. Of course, we are all used to this kind of visualizations, a map with KPIs, but I imagine, for example, this KPIs and this colors of the vessels to be based on the CII, for example, or on the performance of the engine, or whatever we want to monitor and to stream on shore side. Um, this is just to show how uh, a performance target can be evaluated. As I said, we have black box uh, possibilities, so with machine learning techniques, together with other techniques that are more basic, so like a white box based on ETTC and ISO 15016, and a continuous benchmark with the predicted tower power and the actual power of the vessel, of course, give the opportunity to quickly intervent and react in case of need and a loss of efficiency. Let's go to the part where we actually optimize the um, operations of the vessels. So now we have many questions raising up. So shall our ship reduce the speed? Yeah, most probably yes. How much shall it reduce in order to comply with CII? Uh, shall this ship be more loaded? Is the ship going to meet the standards on this specific trade? I'm going to deploy it. Or shall I select another ship to deploy it on the same trades in order to have better uh, energy efficiency indexes? So with the voyage optimization, is actually possible to build a model of a vessel, let's say an hydrodynamic uh, digital twin of a vessel with uh, machine learning techniques then it's possible, of course, with the algorithms to plan the 
voyage with departure date uh, and time, arrival date and time, add constraints and so on, and then optimize uh, the different parameters. So we can work on CII, uh, fuel consumption, uh, money, so directly on the cost. And out of that, it's possible also to understand how to improve the uh, deployment of the vessels and the operations in order to fit the baselines. So what does make these systems reliable? So it's important to have, of course, a very good route optimization algorithm. The second part is to have a very good ship response modeling. Because of course, if the ship is not represented in a good way, what we're going to simulate will not represent the real operation of a vessel. And of course, have updated mid-ocean forecast um, so a reliable partner to provide weather information. As I said, the core of such systems, in my opinion, is actually how we model the vessel. So we have different available techniques and our system can manage all of them depending on the data available. So at first we have white box models which are more representative of the physical aspect of the vessel. So we can take, of course, into consider consideration ship loading conditions. Uh, we base it on ITTC, ISO 15016, and so on. But usually, this kind of models do not predict very well the performance of a vessel, especially when we take into consideration uh, the, weather, the different weather conditions. Then we have the black box models, so pure machine learning techniques. Uh, this model usually give a very good uh, percentage of error, so very little percentage of error. And uh, on the other hand, they lose all the physical aspect of the vessel. So it's just data in and then a result out. In between, we have the gray box model, so which is actually a white box model, so a more physical model, then optimized to take into consideration the real data. And in this way, we can keep the physical aspect of the vessel into consideration together with the possibility to have uh, better and smaller errors on the prediction. So what we optimize? As I said, we, of course, optimize the plan route. We try to minimize, you see, we have an example of a result, the, for example, fuel consumption, CII or EOI, we can also take into consideration the fuel cost depending if you're going in ECA areas or not and if we have scrubbers installed or not. So with certain constraints that are very tailored and that can be changed, we can really, in this case, understand what we are about to save choosing between the different routes. So here I just have uh, a video of uh, a result of an optimization. In this case, we are actually saving at 2.4%. We see the weather going and the vessel saying, and so on. So just as a conclusion, digital could actually help to build a virtuous cycle with the vessel. So collecting the information on board, monitoring, having the opportunity to analyze the data on shore side allows to stay very close to this valuable asset, very costly asset that we have, create a link with the crew on board and increase the shore, on shore awareness of what's happening on board. Then, of course, using the data, we can optimize the uh, operations to reduce the carbon footprint and, again, monitor the efficiency over time and properly act. And then we start again, all over again. So digital could really be a link between all this part and all the interventions that can be done on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela, for this interesting presentation. It seems like uh, the most important is data, data, and data. My and opinion, then, yeah. And then what do you do with it? And that's um, a lot of what you've been explaining today. Are there any questions from the audience uh, regarding this? We have a question here in the front. You are talking about um, <coughs> data, measured data. Uh, and you refer many times in your speeching about errors. Yeah. Just in a way to say, and you want to say it's uncertainty, 
or exactly you want to say is error? I'm talking about error in predicting the real condition of a sailing vessel. So my model will predict, I don't know, 1,000. The recorded power on the vessel, maybe it's 1,200. So we may have some error in the predictions. The uncertainty is another point. For example, the black box models, we never know when the model will over predict or under predict. So that's an uncertainty. And that's why not all the models are okay for every application. It's important to select the correct model. Super clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions at all from the audience? No, I think uh, it's been very, very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're moving on to the um, last presentation before the coffee break, and here we're going to be looking at operational efficiency. So a very, very, very important part of our business, what to do today, tomorrow, and thereafter. We have Mikael Lauren from Yara Marine Technologies. Please come to stage. Thank you. So, I'm going to make sure you really want a coffee in like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, and I'll be talking a bit, a little bit about Yara, who we are, what we do, and then about efficiency. But first, who am I? Why am I here? I'm Mikael Lauren. I work with Yara Marine Technologies. Uh, Yara Marine Technologies is a part of Yara, a big fertilizer company. But that part is very focused on ship efficiency. We used to do scrubbers only, but now we're expanding the portfolio to do wind power, we do shore connection, we do vessel optimization, and so on. And that is because we see there's a need for these type of services. Uh, I'll actually skip this slide and talk a little bit about where I come from. A couple of months ago, I was part of a smaller company called Lean Marine that was acquired by Yara Marine. Before that, I ran a tanker operator, so I used to be a ship owner. And if you see, this presentation will be from Yara Marine, and it will also be from my experience as a ship owner. So I'm going to mix and match a little bit and sort of get my view on what you should do today, what you need to do tomorrow, and where we're going in the future. The Lean Marine portfolio, or Yara Marine Vessel Optimization, has so far introduced its products to about 200 ships. So it's tried and tested. We've been out there for quite some time, working with all types of ships in the industry, and we believe we're saving quite a substantial amount of fuel. Now, where do we start? We've heard a lot of really interesting presentations during these two days. And thank you very much, Michaela, for sort of laying the groundwork for data collection, which is something I believe strongly in. Thank you very much for everybody else sort of getting, showing the different solutions there are. And I want to say that I'm very optimistic when you're in a room like this. Everybody in this room has understood what we need to do and that we need to start doing it now. There's a tomorrow in this presentation because we can't do everything today, but we need to start today. We can't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be too late. So where to start? I just put this slide up to show that there's a lot to do. There's so much to do, and it's very difficult to see where to start. I believe we can break it down a little bit if we look at ship efficiency. There are three parts of a ship voyage. There's the planning phase. You get a voyage, you need to go to Quinana in Australia. Okay, so you need to start planning your voyage. Which ship to use, what's the cargo, how do you load it, how, what's the weather like on the way, and so on. What speed should I use? Next part is actually executing the voyage, going to Quinana. Uh, and the third part is what you need to do after the trip. There's a lot to do after the trip as well, and a lot to learn if you have the proper tools. So the planning phase. A lot of things that go into this, I just mentioning a few, you definitely need to look at your route. Which road are you going to take? Your ECTA system is going to tell you this is the way to go. If you're smart, you have a weather routing system that's actually going to look at what are the conditions on the route. Is there a better way to go? There's a lot to be saved on this, not on every voyage, but if there's a big storm, if there's something happening along the way, 
there could be 10 plus percent savings, no problem with a proper weather routing system. Doing the planning, thinking ahead. And then of course, people have mentioned it before, but speed. Speed is extremely important. We've heard people say, well, fuel is the big thing. Optimization is just part of the solution. Yes, but if we wanna put nuclear on a ship, if we can put a smaller nuclear reactor by knowing that we can go at a lower speed, that's a lot of savings. We might be going from 1.3 billion to 1.2 billion. That's a lot of money. That's savings we want. We wanna make sure we get efficiency gains today because that's gonna help us enable the solutions of the future. And from my experience, we saw that by talking to the charters, making sure they don't demand that you go full speed, making sure there's some leeway in how you operate. There's thousands, we saved about $1,000 per day on an MR tanker, which is quite substantial looking at, especially looking at the earnings today, it's more or less all you make. Uh, so this is something where you really need to start. You need to look at your speed. You need to start talking to the stakeholders. Make sure that the charters, a couple of charters in the room, and the operators and everybody else involved talk to each other and realize there's money to be saved here, and more importantly, there's CO2 emissions to be reduced. Okay, executing the voyage. Going from A to B, nice and simple, all the captains know how to do. You, of course, since you've done your proper vessel optimization calculation and calculated what's the best speed, you'll, of course, need to keep your speed during the voyage, right? You need to make sure that everything is spick and span on the vessel. You need to make sure you don't have fouling on the hull, and so on and so forth. And you need to adapt to changing conditions. Now I'm coming in a little bit to the products we have. Uh, one thing that strikes me is that whether it's a huge container vessel, VLCC, whatever, or your little uh, day cruise you have at home, you are controlling it through a lever where you are, usually have the numbers one to 10 written on it, or one to 100, depending on the brand. Is that what you're looking to control? Is that the thing you wanna control? Most probably not. You probably wanna have a better tool of uh, steering this whatever 10, 100 megawatt system you have installed on board. Uh, our solution for that is FuelOpt. It's an automated system that sits on top of existing systems and basically gives you better tools for controlling the vessel. You can control on speed, you can control on speed of the ground, you can control on engine output, or you can control on consumption, if that's what you're looking for. It's a fairly simple system where you get, you have a panel on the bridge where you basically dial in the parameters you want. If you've done your planning right, and thought it through, you will know exactly what you want to control. It's probably not going to be RPM. It might be consumption. You might have a speed restriction in your charter party, so you might want to have that. But this system gives you control, full control. It can help you over consume by setting standards. Even if you know you need to go at a certain speed, whatever, but usually a charter party contract says you don't need to if the weather's too bad. So you can set a consumption upper limit. That will save you a lot of fuel when the weather goes bad. Also what it does for a controllable pitch propeller is that it takes control of the propeller and the um, engine and makes sure they work optimally together. One important thing in this as well when you come to the planning, if you plan right, you can make sure you control the voyage. I've spoken to so many ship owners or operators who say, yeah, many captains, they like to speed up initially. You wanna have a bit of a time cushion, make sure you can make it if the weather goes bad, or they need to speed up at the end because they did, didn't do the planning. But the most efficient way to run a voyage is to make sure you're running at a constant consumption or constant power outtake all through. And with fuel up, you can get that because you will be controlling on consumption or kilowatt if you have the option and you will be avoiding volatility as well. So we see on fixed pitch propellers, this is an example with a 200 uh, deadweight Valker, they were saving about 225 tons of fuel per year. That is a start, that will get you somewhere. 
that will pay for the system as well. So that's really interesting. We see fixed pitch ships saving two to five to six percent per year, roughly, by just taking control of this. If you have a controller pitch propeller, usually the setup is that you're running the ship where an engine RPM is matched to a propeller pitch. So at 100 RPMs, the pitch will be at 75%, and so on. But that figure is set from to fit all types of weathers, all type of hull fouling, all type of turbocharger issues. So there's a lot of extra space in that. There's a lot of cushion in that you can take away. And what we do is we go in and regulate them uh, and optimize how they're regulated together. Very, very simply put, we try to make as much pitch as possible for the least RPM. If you're running 100% speed full ahead, 100% pitch, nothing to optimize. But if you're slow steaming, which I hope you are by this time, after sort of thinking about how much you can save, that earlier speaker said as well, then you'll be running at suboptimal conditions. And then there's usually a lot to be saved. We see savings at certain speeds of 15, 20% at those speeds, and we have customers claiming they save 10% on average for their ships, again, with controllable pitch propellers. We have one big uh, ferry operator that saves eight tons of fuel per day, and that's substantial. That is quite a lot. That is an enabler for other technologies. Also, I just want to mention, since the system controls on power, it logs what you do. It's not compliant because the rules are not set, but we believe we're in very good shape to have an EXI uh, shaft power limitation system with this because it's exactly what it does. Just want to mention that. That's something we can definitely do. That's sort of very high on many companies' agendas right now. So. Okay, we've done the voyage, done it really well, at a low speed, arrived in Quinana. Now what? Well, we need to do some reporting. We have tools for reporting. You need to look at your performance. And again, I can just uh, say the previous speaker talked a lot about this. I won't get into the details. You all heard why you need to do it and what you can, uh, what you can save on it. But I think it's worth mentioning a few more things. Uh, why? do you log? We heard Nicholas from ABC Maritime saying yesterday, who's going to pay for the data logging? Well, the ship owner will, in my opinion. And again, I used to be a ship owner. We paid for it. It made sense. We could save a lot. Today, I'm data logged like crazy. I have a watch that's controlling what I do and measuring. Google knows way more about me than I do. My phone is taking all my measures. Everything I do online is logged. So why? Well, I learned that my step length is 30.3 inches, that I had 13 exercise minutes yesterday. Uh, please don't look at the statistics. It's really poor. It's from yesterday. I hardly moved at all. But what's this good for? Well, it's basically good for nothing if we can't use it. But ship data is useful. If you look, as an example, on different measures you can put in a ship. There's so much you can do, and every percent saved is worth doing. But a lot of them are in the 1% to 10% range. If you have noon reports, if you don't have digitalized measurement, you will have at least 5% to 10% measurement error in the data you get. So it's basically useless to try to see, did the variable frequency I put on the fans in the engine room, do they make a difference? You have no idea. So you need to know. It's only when you can measure it that you can manage it. So only when you can measure it, you can learn and see what works, what does not work. So I'm a very strong believer in measuring. I'm a very strong believer in using the data as well. Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about big data, about AI, and so on. And you can do so much with it. And it can also be so useless if you don't use the data. But you need to get there because the tools are there now. Again, Google does it amazingly of mapping me, and so does Facebook and whoever. We can learn from that. The tools are there, and there's a lot to do. We can 
make sure we work to turn big data into knowledge and just not, not, just not into a big database. And once we have the knowledge as well, once we have the data and start looking at data modeling, we can start predicting the future. We can start not only see what did we do right yesterday, we can start looking at how do we do it better tomorrow. And that's a big thing. Our solution for that and um, for measuring is fleet analytics. We learned very early on that our customers weren't happy enough when we started installing the fuel product with us saying, it works, you're saving fuel. They said, okay, how much? What are we saving? Well, we had all the data signals into the system, so we started building an interface on them to show this is before, this is after, this is what it looks like. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but it takes all the data you have, presents it in a different way for an operator or operations department. You can do reporting, get your MRV reports automated, get your CII reports automated. You can do analytics. You can see in my fleet the sister vessels. How are they doing? How are they co doing compared to each other? Is there something we can learn from this latest voyage? Uh, this specific one here shows what happened when fuel op is on or fuel op is off. You can show the savings. Uh, and this I already said, this is, you're going to need this if you're a ship owner. You're going to need to start measuring being able to do the reporting or to fulfill the reporting requirements of the future. So I think it's better to start now and then you'll have the data and start learning now. AI solutions are really interesting. We've been playing around with it a bit on a professional basis. You can learn so much when you have the data, if you know what you're looking for. You can use it extensively to predict what's going to happen. And what we've been doing is looking at, if you have a route, you know you're going to Quinana from Houston, you have the weather, you have six to eight months of detailed ship data, then you can actually predict exactly how the ship will perform. That means you can start looking at lowering the speed. That's the big fuel saver. You can start looking at whether there are shallow water effects. We need to go slower. There might be bad weather on some part where you need to slow down as well because full steam ahead in bad weather is not going to give you anything anyhow. And then you can build a speed profile which is much more advanced and saves you a couple of percent more compared to just doing the standard. And also, since it's based on your ship, how it's performing right now, it's going to be pretty good. You will need to update it along the way to get it right, but it's going to be really good. So, you've done your planning, execution, post voyage, and the important part is to take what you learned and put it into the planning phase. This is fairly natural. It's nothing new. It's been PDCA cycles written on consultants reports forever and ever. But I think it's important to realize the tools are out there. We can start doing this now. And there are a lot of suppliers of it. And most of them are really good. Now, back to the question, what to do today, what to do tomorrow, what to do in the future. This is my personal view. But I think what we need to do today is to start measuring so we can manage. We need to know how our ships are performing. That is just a given. We also need to slow down. Already said everything needs to be said about that. That's the easiest way to save fuel. And we need to start collaborating. A lot of previous speakers have spoken about that as well. You need to collaborate with everyone, with your competitors if you can, with your customers, with your suppliers, with the ports, with everyone. You can't make a shore power system on your own because it won't work. There won't be any power import. You'll have a different standard. So standards is a huge thing about this as well. You need to get your standards right. And here we go. And you need to educate. You can get all the technical fun stuff, technical gadgets you want. But if you don't have the crew on board, the operations department, the chartering department, along on the ride, you're not going to get there. You need to make sure everybody on board knows what to do. We had a vessel in the tanker company where we put measuring equipment on board the vessel. Great stuff. 
saw a lot of interesting data, and nothing happened on the fuel consumption. So we sent our um, environmental manager on board for a week, educated everyone on board, showed them what to do, how to think, and we saw 9.83% savings after that. We needed the tools to be able to show it, but we also needed the education to change the mindsets of the people. You need to make sure everybody's pulling in the right direction. I believe everybody in this room has the right mindset. We all want to pull in the right direction, but there's still a lot of people in the shipping industry that don't. They have a different way of thinking. They're thinking dollars and cents and not realizing fuel is dollars and cents. Our customers are demanding that we are green. Regulation is demanding that we're green. So there's money to be had in this as well. So that's what we do today. Tomorrow, learn from the data. Make sure you use it. Make sure you know why you're collecting data. Make sure you know what you want to get out of it. Again, a lot of good tools, a lot of good ways to do that. And then test. Klavenes, a uh, Norwegian company, has the mantra, test a little, learn a lot. I think that's really wise. You need to test a lot of things. And right now, especially on the fuel side, going forward, in my opinion, if I, as a ship owner, what do you kind of ship your order? No idea. But we need to try and all. We need to try all solutions, see what works. Is it atomics? Is it methanol? Is it LNG? Right now, we don't have the answers. So we need to learn more. We need to test and we need to learn. And again, we need to collaborate with everyone. We need to make sure we have contracts that are sustainable. We need to make sure we get rid of paper and digitalize all of that. And we just need to make that work. Then what? Well, then we change the game. It's been done before. Container ships change the game for dry cargo or for, for that. Tanker ships change the game where they come with big tanks. Coal change the game from wind. We need to do it again. We can't keep doing what we're doing. We need to start now, start changing everything in what we do to make sure it's pulling in the right direction. And we need to build the ships for new generation. A lot of the things I've been talking about will help. It's retrofitable, but the big change is, of course, going to be on the new ships. And this is a photo of my son many years ago standing standing in front of a ship, and that's the guy we're building for. That's the guy that's going to seem to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikael. It's a very, very interesting speech, uh, very well delivered. Um, we have a question that's already come up uh, on the screen. Before we get on to that question, I just want to see whether there are any questions in the audience. Chris has a question, and we have a question here. Um, why don't we go to Chris, and then we'll go to the screen. Um, Chris. Hi. Um, thanks. Really interesting presentation. Uh, thanks for mentioning EXI and CIRs. I'm going to talk about them later. So, brilliant. Um, I had two kind of detailed questions about the fuel ops product, because it looks really interesting. Uh, one is on where you're optimizing the control rule on, on the pitch and the control rule pitch propellers. How does the system work in the optimization? Is it based on a theoretical model of the performance of the vessel, or is it based on real-time feedback from torque measurements, fuel, RPM? The latter. It's real-time. So it's listening, taking in signals from engine, propeller, yeah. when there's an inclinometer on board to sort of get uh, how the ship moves, and then based on that, it optimizes. So yeah. it's not on a model, it's on actual yeah. real-time data. Brilliant. Good. Thanks. Um, <coughs> and then on, on, fuel on the fuel op where you're running constant power, constant RPM, and, and <coughs> I think that's really important, really good thing to do. Is there, is there a link to weather routing systems, uh, either your ones? So it's telling you what the power is that you need, the constant power that you need to be setting at a given time. Because obviously throughout the voyage, the optimum power or RPM is changing depending on that, that optimum voyage yes. profile. Yes. Either you set the, va the values manually on the um, panel on the bridge, or you can have an interface from a uh, 
routing system, basically telling the system, right now you need to go at this speed, this kilowatt, whatever the routing system is working with. So we have both options. So it's a one way. If you have another route planning system or route execution system, you can have that data go straight into this to control your propulsion. All right, brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, really exciting. Thank you. Um, we had a question up on the screen, in fact, from uh, Peter in the audience. Um, are naval schools paying enough attention to AI solutions? Where else? And what is the most advanced school in your view and why? I think I have to take the fifth on this one and claim ignorance and whatever, because I have no idea, actually. Uh, I know the maritime schools in Sweden are looking at this, and I know the universities are doing quite a bit. But I must say, I don't really know what the schools are doing. Uh, but I definitely believe there's more to do, and I believe there's a lot to do for re-education, or continuous training, rather, for the seafarers to make sure they understand the issues and what to do. Otherwise, we have a question uh, here. And so the microphone is just coming over. I have to say that I am skeptic uh, on part of uh, what you say is uh, related to measurements uh, and then uh, go to calculate uh, the savings. And I am skeptic because, first of all, I think that uh, if you go to combine uh, the uncertainty and you go to propagate uh, the uncertainty, that will be difficult. I have no idea how you can propagate uh, the uncertainty here. I have the impression that the total uncertainty is much, much bigger than any savings that you can achieve. Mm, I am convinced that measuring is perfect, is the, the right way to do, but I have the impression that probably at the end uh, you have to go more on empiric side of the medal with historical data, may making the evaluation of uh, how much you save on the same voyage knowing the condition of the voyage, even if it will be difficult because the weather will be never exactly the same. By the way, my skepticism is also based on the fact that the large part of the instruments that you have on board, uh, first of all, no one gives you the uncertainty of the instruments. Second, you don't know the level of uh, calibration of the instruments. By the way, I think it's a very nice exercise. For sure, it's something that uh, have to be done, uh, but I think that in this moment uh, I saw like impossible to do the evaluation of the savings making this kind of exercise. Uh, probably, w uh, as you said, uh, a large group of collaboration can create or can found the way to do, but in the first uh, hypothesis I think is difficult. Because I if you take uh, just uh, a, a the angle of the pitch, like you say, who, who can say to us uh, which one is the uncertainty in the regulation of the angle? I think it doesn't exist. By the way, uh, I, I am interested, but at the moment, uh, skeptic. I'd be very curi curious to hear your, your comments on that. Thank you. I love skeptical people, so let's talk later. Uh, I agree. First time I met Fuel Ops, I was a ship owner. And the technical director said, we need this. And I told them, why? Doesn't the engine maker do this? Doesn't Kongsberg do it? Isn't, shouldn't this be part of it? But then I was actually, um, I was convinced after a while. But I agree with you. We don't get perfect savings. The 9.83% savings, there's probably a few percent or margin in that as well. But I think the more we know, the more we can measure, the better our guesses will be. We won't know for sure by any time. And things change. You might have the perfect digital twin of your ship, then you lie still in port for 10 days, and all of a sudden the hull is gro has growth on it. Then all of the calculations are going to be wrong, just the way it is. But at least we'll have, we'll have better calculations than we have with no data. So I think the trick is to get there. And also we're working quite a bit with making sure the data is correct. Because we see ships from time to time that have negative consumption. And that is just amazing when you get that. It's so nice to have an en engine that's pushing out more oil than you go getting into it. But also means there's a measurement error of quite substantial proportions. So I fully agree with you. 
Skepticism is good, and measurements are not going to be perfect, but we can do a lot. We can get there and learn from it as well, and filter out and see the sort of bad data when you work with it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your clear answers for your excellent presentation, and please join me in thanking Mikkel for his presentation. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the first session this morning, and we're going to be having our coffee break in a second. Just to remind you, this, uh, uh, later on this morning, we have a presentation on fouling prevention. We're going to be talking about uh, from hearing from Dyna rigs and ship digitization for better efficiency. Uh, we have a lot to cover still this morning. And then this afternoon, we also have quite a lot to cover. Very, very interesting presentation, which you should be expecting. Uh, we'll be hearing from the uh, how Swiss R&D and international cooperation contribute to sustainable maritime transport solutions from the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. And we'll also ha be hearing from Chris, uh, Chris Hughes from Lloyd's Register, and he'll also be chairing a panel. The panel seems to have grown overnight, and so now we have four very interesting speakers on the panel. Um, in fact, we're hearing from Simon Bennett from the ICS, from ja Jan Hoffman from UNCTAD, um, also hearing from Marcio, who is the Global Logistics Director of Bungi, so looking at it from a time charter and also a ship uh, cargo owner point of view. And then also we're joined from the World Economic Forum by Emma Skov Christiansen, and so it should be very, very interesting. And then towards the end of the day, we're also looking at monitoring the crew's health. And so we're gonna have a presentation from SGS, and we're gonna finish up the day looking at how are we going to fund all of this? And so some very interesting presentations um, being led by Olivier Straub from MSC. And so right now we have our coffee break. We'll be back here at 10.30. Uh, sorry, we're back here at 11.10. It's 10.30 now. We're back here at 11.10 for to start our next presentation. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you. Right, I hope that you had a very nice coffee break and managed to, to talk with a lot of your colleagues. Now we're going to start the second session of this morning. We have a packed session, very, very interesting presentations. And we're going to start off actually looking at innovation solutions for fouling prevention. This is also a subject that was brought up quite a lot this morning, certainly in terms of efficiency, um, optimization of the vessels. From Hatag Maritime, we have Gregor, who's going to come and talk to us about that. Please welcome him to the stage. Hello together. One of the topics we have spoken most about in the last days was sustainability. Uh, sorry, <laughs> my English is not so very good. Um, sustain sustainability means that we invent new technology which uh, is green and also cost effective because otherwise um, you wouldn't use it. And um, in the meantime, um, it means that we put some innovation into old technology and make it more uh, usable and also help them to get there. And uh, with this introduction, let me introduce myself. My name is Gregor Kozlowski from Hatak Maritime Germany. And I'm the developer um, of the Hatak FF an innovative, eco-friendly, and cost-effective solution to prevent fouling on your ships and boats and other structures. So every one of you surely knows that fouling can have a bad influence on the hydrodynamics of a ship and also on the weight. But did you know how bad the number really is? It's about 150 kilograms per square meter fouling in just six months. You may doubt it, but it's a little bit more than my mess. And uh, on a shorter scale, um, I was also doubting this number, but it's from uh, the IMO. You can look it up on Google. So the question is, how can we efficiently pro uh, protect our vessels? And like mentioned, we have the Hartag fouling release film, a biocide-free fouling prevention film, specially designed for permanent uh, use on ships and other structures in the water. When you compare a film with an usual paint, 
we are more sustainable in at least five points. Because on the one side, of course, it is a film, so you have no VOCs, you have no solvents that gas out into the atmosphere. You have no biocides because we work with a fouling prevention silicone on top. And this fouling prevention silicone is really super smooth. You can never paint a boat this smooth like with the film. This reduces the hydrodynamic resistance in the water because the surface is super smooth. The silicone is super hydrophobic. It repels water very well. And this is the positive effect that you reduce fuel consumption. And by reducing fuel consumption, of course, you reduce your emissions. Next point is the uncomplicated disposal of the film. Because you have no biocides inside, you don't have any toxic waste that you need to dispose. You can just throw it normally away. Every one of these points means cost savings for you. So even if you are not interested in saving the environment, uh, cost saving is always something important for us, especially in our industry and especially working on, on emissions and decarbonization. The film is built up, like you see on the picture, but I have also a sample here. You have on top a protection film. You have on the back a release paper. And if you want to protect the surface, you just take a sample put it on top, and the table is now protected for fouling at least for five years. Do it this way with paint. You have drying times, you have solvents here in the room. I couldn't do this with paint. The adhesive that we have on the film is an specially de developed adhesive uh, for underwater applications. It cross-links with most of corrosion protection uh, uh, paints, and this way it makes it impossible to detach in the lifespan of the film. In the middle, I have a very durable PVC film and on top the fouling release uh, layer, which prevents the fouling and also reduces the drag in water. And one important point is I have no, um, no solvent silicones. Because some of you, maybe you are ship owners or uh, you work together with your dogs and you already wanted to try uh, silicone paints or fouling release paints, um, but the dog owner knows um, once you use sil um, solvent silicones, they contaminate the whole area and you cannot paint uh, other paints anymore because uh, they wouldn't stick to the surface. Um, to be honest, we have almost no solvent silicones because when you have two lanes of the film applied on a hole, then we seal uh, the joint between them also with a an, with an silicone, um, but it's very high viscose and we don't spray it, so you don't need to worry about this. And uh, this brings me to my last slide. It's an appeal to you. Because when you are worried about solvent silicones, maybe you are conservative and just work with the paints you already know, that you already trust. Or you had a bad experience already following release silicones in the past. Um, I ask you please, try following release coatings. Because uh, they have improved over time. Um, fine release coatings are used now on the market at least for, I think, 20 years. And at the beginning, they have been not so good, so you had growth on the silicone. Um, the scratchability, the damages wasn't so good like they are right now. Um, try fine release coatings. Even if you don't use our film, which is superior to paint, um, they really improved. And the most important thing, the benefits outweighed by far the investment you need to take. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's such an important issue, certainly when we're talking about the efficiencies of, of vessels. Um, and we've moved on quite a, a bit from the days when we used to just coat the vessel with, with copper uh, to prevent fouling. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience? We do have a question right at the back there. If I could ask somebody with a microphone, hang on a sec. Uh, otherwise, I will grab the microphone. There we go. See, multitasking. Um, so sorry, we had a question. I've certainly seen photos of vessels which have been sitting in West Africa for a couple of months, and you'd be amazed at the, the mess on the vessels. 
please. Is Hanne uh, talking? Um, you said you are using PVC film. Um, was there no other possibility for other <coughs> materials? Because PVC is not really known to be very, very sustainable. Um, from a ec ecological point, um, you, you are right. Uh, but from a technical point, uh, PVC is the best material to work with because, um, uh, for example, if you take uh, like in PE film, you have the problem when you try to remove uh, the film um, from, from, from the boat uh, or from a ship, um, it's more likely that the adhesive stays on the hull. And this is something that we wanted to prevent. Um, so from this reason, um, we, we stayed with PVC because you have be better surface energy to adhere also the, the silicone on top and the adhesive on the backside. And it's thermoplastic, so when you have welds on the boat, you just heat the film up and it's really uniform with, uh, with your hull. There was another question. Um, perfect. That makes life easier. So Sue's asked question, does it work on composite boats and also how about leisure boats? It works very well on uh, composite boats. Actually, we started with, uh, with the sailing industry. Um, because the um, uh, drag reduction is wa in water is almost 14%. So for sailing boats, if you have a regatta, you're faster than other boats. And uh, since it is a new technology, it was easier for us to approach it with smaller boats and to see if the technology works well. And uh, we worked with this film since um, 2013. And uh, now we are moving up and into, the, into the industry and big vessels and big ships. Uh, this is the target for us in the future. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, we do have a lot to cover for the rest of the morning, so I think it's been very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so now we're going to move on, and uh, we have a presentation from Damon Roberts, uh, who's the director of DynaRig's projects, and he's going to tell us about the evolution of DynaRig for commercial shipping. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, t I'm going to s uh, speak very briefly, 10 minutes. I'm going to really try hard to go through that. I'm going to talk about the Dynarig, and it's a proven sailing system that's in use today on very large um, sailing vessels. And uh, right now, we have a number of commercial um, applications for that as well. So. Uh, so, so a little bit of a background to what is a Dyna rig, where we are today uh, on, on the experience record of these rigs, and where we're moving forward to on commercial variants of the rig. So the Dyna rig, um, actually, it, this is a bit, really should be uh, called the return of the Dyna rig, because the Dyna rig was originally conceived by a German engineer, Willem Proles, in the 1970s at a previous fuel crisis that engulfed the world. Um, the German government invested quite heavily in it. A lot of research work was done in it. You see here a picture of some of the wind tunnel work that was done. It was a multi-masted uh, vessel, um, but it never got built. The fuel crisis passed, and uh, despite many attempts over the years, uh, it never attracted attention. Roll on a few years, 2001, venture capitalist Tom Perkins, responsible for many of uh, America's uh, top um, innovative companies, uh, asked Perini Navi to come up with an innovative solution for a very large boat where he could reduce the crew numbers and make it a lot simpler. He wanted a, a rig that could sail um, uh, by itself or with only one person effectively. Uh, Jerry Dykstra, a well-read, very well-accomplished naval architect who I'd worked with for many, many years before that on a number of innovative rigs, including the first J-class rigs, the first uh, transatlantic schooner rigs, and a few square riggers as well uh, um, that we did along the line. He came up with the idea, had written, he, was, he had read about it, and he suggested it to Tom, and Tom said, yep, that's for me. Um, I think Tom said at the time, it, he studied it long and hard, and 30 seconds later, he made a decision. <laughs> uh, that's the Dyna rig. Um, that's Maltese Falcon um, uh, w w when she was launched. Basically, what it is is a freestanding uh, mast um, and on which a, s a permanently linked set of yards, to use the old terminology, and the sails um, furl into cavities in the mast and come out of those cavities um, automatically and run down tracks on the yard above and the yard below. 
uh, in order to create a complete wing effect. So very unlike the old square riggers, it's a complete wing effect, rather like an, uh, a bird wing or a bat wing, effectively. And, and the whole process is fully automated. The, the real benefits, I guess, I'm not going to go too much detail, but basically on these big boats, and the second one down here is Black Pearl, she's 106 meters, can set all sail in six minutes. I can do that on the screen. I can maneuver the boat, whatever I want, tack it, jibe it, one person can do that. In, in, and uh, 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 it can be done by a single crew member, effectively. But perhaps more importantly, it's very safe. There are There are no lines to the deck whatsoever on this boat. So there's no flogging of high loaded lines on the deck. There's no interference with the deck space. The, the mast is just purely supported at the deck and at a heel bearing. Moreover, it's got a, a, all these big rigs of a very advanced integral fiber optic monitoring system, which shows the crew on board the load and actually shows us the history of the boat, of the rigs from the day that they were actually stepped on, on the boat. Of, of course, it's green, you know, because it's easy to use. You sail everywhere. Maltese Falcon actually sails nearly everywhere. She spends 85% of her time sailing. Black Pearl has an energy regeneration system as well, can do long distance voyaging completely fossil fuel free. Um, We've raced the boat. <laughs> We've done many races. This is Maltese Falcon at 90 meters racing conventional yachts, and we've won a lot of these races. And we've done that with two guys on the bridge in short courses, bouncing around in between the rocks. Um, what we have actually achieved is something like uh, 300,000 miles plus over a, um, and with a combined length of between the two big boats of over 20 years of seagoing experience. 10,000 sail sets and recovery, um, exposed to severe storm conditions on several occasions, 60 knots plus. I think you saw a little picture yesterday from my colleague of, of Black Pearl heeled to 30 degrees in a 65 knot gust um, in uh, severe conditions. Uh, we have the full load history of the boats from the day they were launched, and that load history is related to the wind speed direction at the time. So th the boats have proved to be extremely reliable. The rigs have never been removed in that time. MF was launched in 2006. Today, ongoing multiple interest. The previous boats were three-masted. We have a number of projects today in, in course, which are two-masted Dyna rigs from a variety of designers and, uh, and builders. So running now into the commercial application you can quite quickly see that most of the key aspects of requirements from commerciality are there already the performance the reliability the experience the route planning uh, but these are expensive rigs so we've had to work really hard on reducing the cost of these rigs for commercial uh, boats and we've done this by a number of features uh, changes in the rig we've simplified the mast geometry, we've, we've put external furling, we've got steel trusses to, to connect the mast to the, to the yard. The yard is in aluminium, the mast is probably in, in, in a carbon fiber, glass fiber combination in order to really address the low cost building aspect of these rigs. The, the hardware, the sailing hardware is mounted on a removable chassis that can be easily picked off and, and taken away for um, a replacement or maintenance as needed, although we've never had to remove anything um, until now. So this work is very well advanced. I mean, we, we're working on, a, as I mentioned, on, on two projects right now, and, uh, and we're into heavily into the design and engineering phase um, of, of the structures. So that's only part of the picture. A, a number of people today have talked about routing and, and the aspects of routing. So this is a study done uh, by the Dijkstra guys on a vessel called uh, the Ecoliner. Uh, she's a general, she's a specifically designed uh, commercial vessel, 8,000 tons uh, a dead weight, um, it, multiple capacity. I mean, could be designed for 476 TEUs. And, uh, and this has been evaluated on a number of routings. Um, the transatlantic uh, uh, triangle, where you, the clockwise round the transatlantic, for instance. And, uh, and there are a number of routing um, software packages out there, including uh, the ones that the Dijkstra guys have done, where analyzed completely existing weather and come up with weather routings. So 
Up on the right-hand side of this screen here, you see uh, a number of potential routings for various times of the Earth, extracted from historical weather data. And the graph on the left shows uh, actually arrival date versus fuel consumption. Yeah, so you, the, the operator on board can choose what to, to, to do with that. On the left is each one of the voyages that the vessel would have made in that period from 1980 to 2000 in terms of the fuel saving um, uh, for that vessel. And you can quite quickly see on there that around about 200 uh, tons of fuel um, is used on the motor on the, on the vessel when sailing as opposed to around about uh, 330 tons as an average uh, when the, the if it was an equivalent motor only vessel. That's totally uh, related, of course, to the speed at which you wish to design. And right here on these two graphs, uh, we've plotted the fuel consumption versus the average speed um, uh, for, the, for the voyage. And on the right-hand uh, graph, you can see that uh, taking into account uh, by classical costing uh, that the eco-liner with a sail-assisted vessel is actually as economical, in fact, in some areas, more economical than the conventional ship. The sweet spot for each um, is shown. Um, at, uh, at 10 knots for the, for the sail motoring version and around about uh, 12 knots for the, uh, for the motoring versions. So I've pushed through very quickly. We have a number of um, commercial variants out there ongoing, including uh, uh, Ivan Boignon's sea cleaner um, operation, which is designed to recover plastic from the oceans, powered by uh, uh, Dyna rigs and the Dijkstra Ecoliner uh, concept. And there are a number of these uh, concepts that are out there and, and underway at the moment. So it's there, it's that out there today, it's reliable, it's been fitted to big vessels, it's safe technology. Uh, we've commercialized it by significant changes to the design uh, that will bring that capital cost down. Um, it could in fact be a full sailing vessel. It's clearly a route specific. Uh, uh, vessel. It's not intended to be the solution to everything. It's a route specific. And today uh, we have two ongoing uh, projects which look pretty good and we're in the engineering phase right now. We're aiming for a target price per rig of two to three million dollars at this stage, even for those one-off um, uh, rigs. Um, and that seems to work commercially. That's what those numbers were based on. So uh, that's where we get to um, at my, the end of my uh, presentation. So, yeah. Well, Damon, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I think it's fascinating. It's uh, really is enough to make us make us dream, and I, I see a future of very big vessels using the same system. Um, we probably have time for maybe one question, if there is a question in the audience. Um, don't believe there is right now. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Damon for his presentation. <coughs> and so now we're moving straight on. Um, we're going to be looking at ship digitization for better efficiency. Again, we have looked a lot about different data and ways of using this data. And so from Banul's design, we have Renaud Banul, who's going to tell us about that. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Renaud Banyuls. I'm uh, CEO of Banyuls Design, the naval architecture and maritime engineering company. I'm a naval architect myself. Yes, great. Uh, we are based in Brittany, in France. And I'm also teacher, lecturer, uh, and researcher at the high. National uh, School of Architecture in Nantes. A new design or an optimization uh, is commonly based on what we know. From yesterday, we clearly understand that the challenge of decarbonization we are facing today is about what we don't know. Let's take a simpler example uh, compared to maritime industry, maritime environments. 
aircraft industry. Today, aircraft industry doesn't know how they will make a nitrogen aircraft fly. What they know that they have to put the cursor at the maximum and to refine and optimize every system and subsystem of the aircraft to get a chance of success. This complexity is the reason why we need advanced procedures and methods to address a new challenge of a more sustainable, greener, and more robust systems. And these goals require significant evolution in engineering practice. At Banyu's design, to achieve that, we gather all disciplinary in a single team, working and exchanging all the time to improve these methods. We apply our expertise in uh, many fields, maritime energy transition, why we are here, selling performance for the racing, laser, and maritime industry, eco-design, and biodiversity conservation. Maritime environments are highly unpredictable. This implies to investigate diverse problematic of risk-aware engineering practice. Besides the natural probabilistic treatment of the weather conditions and sea states in the engineering, many of the variables and variances of the complexity of marine environments will let us develop very advanced systems. For instance, commercial routes impact the probabilistic distribution of waves and weathers, while the load chart of content ship, the footing of the hull, or many other variables and variances can drastically change its performance and behavior. Further, the nonlinear responses of ships, particularly for wind ship, and the cost of high fidelity simulations make their systems prime candidates for the development of original computational approaches. We are developing these methods in partnership with INRIA, that is the National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology, the Ecole Polytechnique, the Center of Applied Mathematics, the French National Center of Scientific Research, and the Pelagis Observatory for the Conservation of Marine Mammals for the bio Biodiversity Conservation. If we look at the chart here, it shows the conception standard deviation of a product tanker sailing west at 15 knots. The interesting thing here is to get 15 knots in different geographic position. The standard deviation of the conception due to environmental conditions is five megawatt. The most interesting thing is if you just predict in this consumption the same, the support, same environmental condition, you stick with a deviation up to 20 to 25 percent. In a common ship digitization, solidly based on deterministic methodology as physical simulation, CFD, we clearly know that is not enough. We need to revisit the decision-making process to incorporate inherent variables and variances to predict properly and to predict the uncertainty we have in a global model. It's a global system approach. You can see on the, on the diagram here that instead of just having a physical simulation, 
we can't use and get all the data we have on a global system of a ship and to surrogate model from every single data we have as measurements, physical simulation, and uh, all the other uh, approach we can have, we can get. How it works, how we can apply that. We can see our scope of action here on the decarbonization time lapse. We need to clearly keep in mind that we have to improve also the current existing fleet, the new design that every company can launch every day. The breakthrough innovation, we are talking about breakthrough innovation from yesterday, every day, and the industrial system change. Each type of improvement as a level of optimization. Fleet optimization is in regards with components. New design with architecture. Breakthrough innovation with technology and usage. Industrial system change with company strategy. Here we have the example we can do on existing, existing fleets. For instance, we can start with all the data you can have and evaluate all the studies you make or all the measurements you did uh, formally. We can then extract a surrogate model from these data and you can estimate the confidence we can have in a pr in prediction of a new or an optimization of a candidate of candidates of a component. Here you have an example of a bulb optimization. And according to an operating profile, we can explore all the options that can improve and optimize the consumption. For instance, without even simulate with high fidelity tools, we can clearly predict a gain in this example, you have a gain on some of the design of these bulbs of 500 kilowatts with a confidence, a deviation of 100 kilowatts. It means that even with no high fidelity simulation, you know that you can develop some optimization and some gain. The other interesting thing with these methods is that if your confidence is not enough, you will define exactly the area of interest where you need to simulate high fidelity. When it comes to new, to new design, we can have the exact same process, <laughs> but with the, uh, with the addition of all the parameters of the boat. Of course, main parameters, but it could be all the parameters as fooling and engine uh, efficiency and, uh, and many, many uh, other things. The other interesting things is that you can optimize in the meantime the operating profile itself. I talked about root optimization in the, in the, the former diagram. It doesn't mean that we are talking about uh, uh, only weather or a sea state or wha whatever, but it includes all the variances and the variables you can get in, a, in the model. And here you have a chart shows the probability of roots with all the variances of all the variables around the boat. Not only the weather, not only the sea states, but dynamic behavior, fooling states of the hull. It can be also efficiency of the engine. It could be a lot of variables uh, uh, you want. 
when we go for the breakthrough innovation, we can evaluate alternative technologies, whatever wind chips, <coughs> alternative fuel, hydrogen, we talked about that uh, yesterday. And we can see the efficiency distribution of this technology. When I'm talking about distribution, it means that it's not just says that we can have 20% gain or the opposite. But it's more to say that on a given time, on a given operation, all the variances we have about maintenance, again, weather, sea states, fooling, whatever you want, you can have the distribution of the behavior of the boat. It's very interesting because it helps to have a real risk management strategy. It's not to say just this technology is better, the other is better, wind ships is better. It's more to say for an operation, for an operating profiles, we can have the distribution of gain or loss in a strategy of, uh, of for the company. Another important thing we discussed today uh, with a uh, regulation company is a good implementation for regulation because instead of having a state of the art uh, to define a regulation, and we know all that it's very difficult uh, to deal with that with when it comes to innovation, we can clearly develop a distribution of possible with the innovations. And it can have, we can have a real discussion with regulation company to refine and optimize the regulation by seeing the result as a distribution of possible instead of having something uh, determined. What about company strategy? It clearly means that finally, the benefits are simple. We can improve quickly and efficiently the accuracy of the reliability and the reliability of the simulation, increase the exploring capacity of design and technology options, avoid tunnel vision optimization, take fully informed decision with risk assessment, and have a real risk management strategy. Yesterday, I heard, I don't remember what's the presentation, I guess I remember. Be prepared. Being prepared is being informed. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Renaud. Don't run away just yet. <laughs> uh, fascinating presentation, very interesting, all the work you're doing. Um, before we do let you go, do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody like uh, to, to pick Renault's brains uh, on any of the subjects he's been talking about? I guess in that case you are allowed to escape. Uh, please join me in thanking Renault for his presentation. Thank you. And so now we have two more presentations before we have our lunch break. And so sticking to our very busy schedule uh, and some very interesting topics we've been looking at. Now we're going to have a presentation from WinGD from Stefan Goranov, and he's going to be looking at integrated hybrid energy systems, optimizing efficiency, performance, and environmental sustainability of merchant ships. So please join me in welcoming Stefan to the stage. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Stefan Goranov. I'm with <coughs> WinGD. Uh, for those of you who don't know WinGD, we are uh, two-stroke engine designers. Uh, we design engines uh, for the merchant marine sector primarily uh, in the power range from 3 to 80 megawatts, diesel and dual fuel engines. In 2018, we started seriously looking into increasing, boosting up the efficiency of the whole system with our engines. And um, uh, yeah, today I will present you some of the some of the case studies that uh, that lead to that to that efficiency boost. My presentation will start with a brief um, 
context, what do we understand by integrated system? An example for hybrid system with two stroke, uh, for two stroke propelled merchant vessel. Then I would uh, continue with a case study about 2000 TU feeder vessel. Uh, and uh, I would draw some conclusions how the, how the two-stroke main engine fits in a hybrid setup. So the key components from our perspective in, in, the, in the ship hybrid energy system is the two-stroke diesel or dual fuel engines coupled with the shaft generator. Uh, we have uh, electrical energy storage uh, in the system. Some auxiliary loads are connected into this, um, into this small decentralized uh, system, so to speak. Uh, example for auxiliary load can be a bow thruster or stern, stern thrusters if there are. They are electrically integrated with a low voltage power grid. Today, with the advancement of the DC power grids, uh, it makes perfect sense to have, to have such. The DC power grid would interface electrically to ship's electrical power plant where the auxiliary gensets are also, uh, are also connected. And an important factor to be considered is that this all equipment needs to fit on a ship. The DC grid allows uh, pretty straightforward integration with any alternative energy source that might be uh, available. Uh, the key value proposition from our side is the overall man uh, energy management system. Uh, of the of the energy system on board and in terms of integration we look in the four dimensions the first one being mechanical where the weight physical size of the components fits in the ship in question electrical where the distribution conversion and protection of the uh, of the electrical energies is um, taken care of logical where the functionality control and the interaction between the components on the logical level takes place and thermal, how we can minimize the thermal losses in a system. Um, also, the key success factor for, minimize, uh, for maximizing system efficiency, so the, the efficient system lays on three pillars. The first one being system topology, uh, where one should have optimally sized components, fulfilled technical and commercial requirements of the particular ship. Um, for example, if, if, uh, if a battery or a shaft generator is oversized, then up after a certain point, the, the returns are diminishing. So we have marginal increase or quite intensive capital cost. Uh, when it comes to hybrid system, control strategy is very important. Uh, this is the energy management system aimed for maximum efficiency as of the ship as a whole. We are not looking into the main engine or auxiliary engines or the battery. So we really take a holistic look. And last but not least, the life cycle management is quite important. And this, from our perspective, is an integrated advisory system for operation. While all the engines on board are tuned to uh, fulfill certain requirements, uh, NOx, uh, and so uh, one can still alter the overall control strategy of the ship without uh, messing up with the technical file of the engines. As a single line diagram, uh, but the, the, the topology I would like to present today is uh, shown on the, on the slide, where we have a main engine coupled with the PTO, PTI. We have several power converters, inverters. Uh, so this is um, AC DC, so this is a DC, decentralized uh, DC link, so to speak. We have the battery pack, bow thruster connected here. Uh, the connection of the bow thruster here contributes to, to, uh, yeah, to efficient peak shaving of the bow thruster. We have an active front end through transformer uh, coupled to the, to the main AC grid. And now the question is where, when, and how much energy each of these components need to produce, store, and use so that we have, um, that, that we have efficient system. And the tricky <laughs> answer here is that, uh, so th this picture gives an example of, of and fixed RPMs where the most efficient operating point of the main engine is and where the most efficient point of the, of the conversion chain is. And they're not necessarily at the same spot. So the task of the energy management system should be to find at any time the cross section here, which is, uh, which is the most efficient. So what we take as efficient is fuel consumption, emissions, battery lifetime, uh, maintenance cost of the equipment, 
And of course, all this need to be uh, taken into consideration when the ship is safe and reliable to operate. So uh, yeah, we take some constraints in terms of power limits and trans transient capability of the system components, efficiencies of the main engine, shaft generator, gensets, converters, batteries. If you have noticed here, all the efficiencies are, are always taken into consideration. So we, don't, we, we never have 100% efficiency in conversion. The emissions reduction are taken into consideration, maintenance cost, energy storage capabilities determined by power cycles, temperature, reliability and availability in the system, and the lifetime of components. Here, the battery being the most critical one. We take four step in developing such a solution. We start, so here is important to mention that there is no one size that fits all. We, th there are always particular requirements that uh, <laughs> unfortunately for us as a system integrators, we, we can't have a standard solution. So we first collect and analyze all the requirements that are to be collected and analyzed from, the, from our customers. So we, we take uh, consideration on, the, on their functional requirements, on their capital um, uh, commercial requirements, on the, on the space availabilities on the ship and further on. Then we would model and run the whole system in a virtual setup. <coughs> then we would design and implement the system and we would help in the operation and with the life cycle management of the system in terms of, uh, of data-driven advisory services. And tank and battery to propeller and auxiliary low performance optimization suggestions. Let me zoom in in this, um, in this uh, virtual virtualization of the system. So we as engine designer, we possess the physical models that, are, uh, that we use for engine design and they're, they're very high fidelity, um, uh, transient capable, uh, and, and very useful for, for the purpose here. For out of this, we would extract the fuel efficiency maps. We would input some electric database components, efficiency, of, uh, efficiency curves of all the components that we use, and the power demand profiles from the propeller and the auxiliary systems. That would be our input. As a first step, we would feed them into a very fast simulation, which considers only the fuel efficiency maps and auxiliary loads if we have state of charge of the battery and fuel. That would actually confirm our choice of components. Then we would move in a more detailed simulation where all the system would be represented by physical models. And there we would <coughs> input some highly transient uh, components of the power demand profiles. The next step would be in a semi-virtual environment where from the, after this step we would extract the control strategy and we would deploy it on a real controllers while the power part of the system would be emulated, a traditional hardware in the loop setup, which would give us a validated energy management controller that can be deployed on the ship. We would take the operational data from that, repurposing our detailed simulation as a digital twin of the system, and we would get output from that to be uh, on optimized energy management controller based on different constraints. So uh, this would enable us to bias the real-time control. And let me get now to the case study of 2002 feeder ship. Uh, what we have here is a conventional system, what we consider as a baseline. This is a system where the main engine is providing only propulsion power and the electrical power plant is, um, is an island. What we compare with is with, a, with the same system, including a hybrid power pack, which is the same, uh, the, the, the same single line diagram that I've shown earlier. Uh, here we have actually the possibility to remove one of the gensets, which would uh, help uh, to on the return on investment figure. We have the same auxiliary loads in both ships. The propulsion power is the same. However, we have looked here what would the impact be if we upsize the engine. Uh, well, our recommendation is not to be upsized in any way. Uh, the controllable pitch propeller helps a lot in that, uh, in that case, and I would uh, elaborate why a bit later. We have three, uh, actually this is three auxiliary engines, 1.3 mega, uh, megawatts, here we have four. The shaft generator selected is 1.2 uh, 
uh, 1.2 kilowatt hours electrical and the battery pack 565 kilowatt hours. We looked at operational scenario in North Sea where we uh, considered three reefer loads, zero, 50, and 100%, so the, the load utilization at three different speeds at sea, so 10.5, 14.5, and 17 knots. Maneuvering while uh, with bow thrusters arriving in departure and at port, cargo operation and idling. And these are the powers that are available for that, for that particular route. Having the CPP gives us at least twofold advantage. The first one, so we have additional degree of freedom here. We can move on the X axis, uh, de uh, having decoupled the, the engine speed with the speed of, with the speed of the ship. So we can we can move the PTO power op uh, operation on the more efficient uh, area of the engine map, and also. Uh, hmm. Uh, not being restricted of the torque limit of the engine, because when we increase speed, uh, we can power it up more. And the shaft generator on the uh, the shaft generator on the higher powers normally are more efficient. And here, the interesting point is, the red dots are representing uh, the the 10.5, 14.5, and 17 knots in a conventional case, and the green points are representing those. Uh, those in a hybrid case. However, you can see one versus three. Here is the reefer containers utilization. So this would be 10.5 knots with 0% reefers, hybrid, 50%, uh, 100%. This, the, the system runs on gas with no auxiliary engine in operation. So the power output of the main engine is increased by rising its speed leading to also improved shaft generator electromechanical efficiency and the engine operates in a, in a more efficient area of, the, of its BSFC map. So this also applies for higher speeds with three different loads. Very interesting cases when we maneuver the ship. Actually, uh, we, uh, our concept suggests that uh, the ship can be maneuvered without any auxiliary engine in operation. And this is the case uh, at maneuvering speed with 100% reefers. What happens is we can actually move the all operational points in that range, which would significantly contribute to improving the, 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 the gas consumption figure and also the CO2 equivalent, considering the methane slip in, in particular. Uh, just to elaborate what happens in maneuvering without auxiliary engines, we use the state of charge of the battery. So this is where this is the conventional case. We have three gensets on, on load factor 84%. Here we have a bow thruster, and here we are. So here we have the main engine. The green li line is the PTO. And when the bow thruster kicks in, we, uh, we discharge the battery. And this is the battery, uh, the battery power output. So we can we can well get into port from 0 0.8 to 0 0.3 state of charge of the battery. The same applies to uh, departure. Uh, the bottom line we have up to uh, that's at sea, uh, where where we have to up to where we have up to 10% uh, fuel uh, gas reduction consumption and about 20% CO2 equivalent. Uh, these are also different speeds with reefers, and uh, however, the big advantage is in maneuvering, where we have uh, up to uh, nearly 30% um, CO2 equivalent reduction. The methane slip itself is being cut by 70% from the ship as a whole, and uh, the, the gas consumption is reaching around 50%. So this is a potential that we believe we are quite conservative on that, uh, on that numbers. And um, yeah, uh, we, we, we believe we can, we can do better, actually. Uh, right, in summary, in terms of system components, such a system is, is capable to, uh, well, the, the system components, as, uh, our suggested size is 2.25 megawatt uh, electrical uh, shaft generator, which allows no auxiliary engine in operation with 100% reefers load. In the CPP application, uh, CPP application allows no auxiliary engines in maneuvering. Uh, however, here the battery is a must if, we, if uh, this function is envisioned, uh, and the minimum size, uh, in our opinion, should be about 565 kilowatt hours. 
there is a potential for omitting at least one genset. While omitting, omitting genset, we make sure that the ship operates with one genset in standby, always. Uh, given uh, that there is appropriate uh, energy management controller uh, to avoid engine overload, there is no need of upscaling the main engine. Although the CPP imposes inefficiencies in the system, it, they can be neglected because the gains have increased power output of the main engine while keeping the vessel speed of the desired set point uh, outweighs those inefficiencies. Uh, a CPP also extends the range of efficient use of a shaft generator. In terms of efficiency gains, of course, they depend on the vessel speed and uh, reefers capacity utilization, uh, where lower speeds are more efficient. Uh, the CO2 emissions are reduced at sea from uh, up to 20% and uh, around port up to 27. The LNG consumption is reduced at sea by 10%. By, uh, 10%. As a conclusion, uh, what we aim to do is to bring together the main engine, our, everything we do starts from the main engine and goes outwards, the main engine and optimally sized components around it into one system, so they function together as a coordinated whole. The maximum ship's efficiency at any given moment is our goal. What we can achieve with such a system is high operational flexibility, intelligently optimized power production on board at any given moment considering various factors, such as actual cargo load, capacity, uh, capacity utilization, ship speed, demand, area of sailing, and we are looking now into including the environmental conditions and route to, uh, to, uh, to the control. Uh, in that respect, we are looking for partners on that. Um, and uh, we, uh, the optimal energy resources utilization is achieved by maximized usage of the main engine, increased propeller efficiency by utilizing the light running margin for, en for electrical energy production, reduced CO2 equivalence uh, emissions from the ship, safe no auxiliary engine operation, improved overall system efficiency and stability in transient condition. This is given once we have a battery. Uh, our solution of all those are by this blue bo box here that we have developed a hybrid control system that is interfacing on the control level with all the relevant components within the system. And we have developed it with a uh, with few things in mind. It's a fit for purpose real-time optimizer applicable on nearly any engine topology. And it is built with embedded modularity for efficient configuration, testing and deployment. Uh, with other words, any additional functionality that needs to be developed and implemented or any setup can be well configured and um, its implementation would not jeopardize the integrity of the whole system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. A very interesting presentation and it's uh, very kind of you to explain in such detail how it actually works. Um, then we get a good insight into the, the workings of it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I was going to ask you any questions, but I see we do. <laughs> so I'm passing over to you. Yeah, quick question. You said that this will work with any con engine configuration, but would it work with a battery uh, hydrogen fuel cell configuration as well? Yes, with any system configuration. Okay. So, yes. Um, for us, the different components are just parameters in the system, so we can parameterize it and, um, and, and run the optimization function in the controller based on the constraints that the fuel cell would impose, for example. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I have a feeling there's a further conversation to be had here. Um, on that note, are there any other questions at all from the audience? No. Uh, I mean, I think it's uh, it's interesting. Also, the, the one one of the issues we have in our industry is acronyms, and uh, two that came up on your screen was CPP and uh, um, PTO at one point. Which uh, CPP for me is clean petroleum products, and PTO is please turn over. But um, it's something that we also have to work with and to understand, make sure that everyone understands each other. Um, on that note, we have a question that's just come up: um, When will WinDG or launch methanol or ammonia engines? <laughs> uh, well, on our website, I think the fuel, future fuel roadmap is being published, uh, and um, I can't recall the exact year, but whoever asked, I, I will check and, and get back to you.
wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? On that note, can you please join me in saying a huge thank you to Stefan? Very interesting. Thank you. <coughs> and so now we're going to be moving on to the last <coughs> presentation that we have before our lunch break. One thing that I would mention to you is that on the brochure that you have, the agenda that you have on the table in front of you, there have been some minor changes. The latest version of the agenda is available on the website, uh, very easy to find online, and particularly regarding the panel discussion this afternoon, the four participants are listed in the latest version. Or if you're curious, then please track down Chris and he can tell you all about it. Um, on that note, we're going to move on and listen to using a digital twin to optimize the energy efficiency of ships from the company Sirocco. We have Olivier Tayad. Please welcome to the screen. Thank you very much. Um, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm here on the behalf of uh, Sirocco. Uh, we were here last year at the MT and we were here to present uh, our endeavor let me summarize that again. We are a lab in Marseille, south of France, and we're working in maritime innovation. Uh, our mission is to optimize the impact of transportation and energy industries. And our vision is that pioneering accomplishments, we also call them moonshots, are the most powerful catalyst for innovation. So our model is based on the innovation transfer from technological challenges that we set to ourselves to industry's main problematics with a strong focus on maritime transportation. So about technological transfer. Fuel injection, ABS, kinetic energy recovery, they were invented by McLaren F1 team for the race car program. And they were delivered to the mass market after war for cleaner and safer cars. That's one example. Solar Impulse, we had Bertrand uh, last year uh, presenting Solar Impulse Challenge. Their work on the polymers coating of the uh, solar panel has made, made major improvements on mass market solar panels. Another example not shown on the video here, on the slide here, is Rolls-Royce. We all know the big company because they know they're gonna have to generate massive innovation for the new era of aviation. They set themselves an internal project, which is the world speed record of electrical plane. That's their way to generate innovation. So that led us to our own moonshot, the world sailing speed record. We unveiled this record project last year at MT. We're approximately halfway now with the prototype that you can see here, fully fu functional prototype. And I'm gonna show you a quick video of the concept that we're working on. aujourd'hui qu'on s'est donné chez Sirocco, c'est de développer de l'innovation de rupture parce qu'on pense que c'est le seul chemin possible pour vraiment aider à la transition énergétique. Le transport maritime, c'est un domaine qui a très 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 peu évolué ces 50 dernières années. Et il y a tout un champ des possibles technologiques à développer pour rendre ce transport maritime plus neutre pour l'environnement. Cette innovation, on la crée en s'attaquant à des challenges hors du commun comme le record de vitesse. Tous les bateaux à voile fonctionnent à peu près de la même manière. On contre l'eau et on, on utilise le vent. En revanche, nous, on a eu une approche très différente du concept 
de, de l'alignement des forces et on, on arrive à quelque chose d'extrêmement simple, on a réduit l'engin à sa plus simple expression. Et c'est ce qui nous semble être le plus efficace sur l'eau. Mais c'est aussi ce qui demande le plus de contrôle et le plus de, de recherche parce que c'est quelque chose de nouveau. Si on prend l'exemple d'un catamaran, si la force du vent augmente, 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 elle va augmenter jusqu'à un point où le catamaran il se retourne. Et ça, ça va être sa limite de puissance maximum. Nous, on veut s'affranchir de cette limite et pour s'en affranchir, on se rend compte que si on fait s'appliquer ces flèches, ces deux forces au même point, sur notre concept de speedcraft, on aligne ces deux forces pour que ce ne soit plus une limite pour nous en termes de puissance. The thing is that we define a geometry that will generate the formation of vapor by increasing the velocity of the flow around the, the foil. We cannot avoid this cavitation, so what we think is that we are going to use it in a steady way so that we can be stable during the run. We can profit from that so that we can reduce the friction on the surface. Le record, c'est euh, une source d'inspiration, une source d'innovation pour toute l'équipe parce qu'on aime tous le sport et euh, on se lève le matin pour aller chercher ce record justement, être les plus rapides sur l'eau. On est tous des sportifs et c'est sur cette route qu'on crée et qu'on innove tous les jours. On ne veut pas simplement améliorer le record. Notre objectif, c'est pas faire 21 km h Aujourd'hui, on se propose carrément de pulvériser le record. So that's the concept. We're not going to talk about the speed record concept by itself, but we're validating this concept with our prototype. But most importantly, the research on this moonshot program gave its first fruits, validating Sirocco vision. We spotted out 12 innovation out of our research Three of them have reached the industry. And we're going to talk about one today that we made a, a product out of, and it's called Efficient Chip. The common point, one of the common points between our speed record project and transportation is the, the aim for efficiency. And that tool is all about that. It's been built from scratch for the speed record project. In a nutshell, Sirocco Efficient Chip is a digital twin platform that you use for optimization of the energy efficiency and impact of ships, both during design and operation. It's a SaaS platform, it's science driven, We got a few PhDs working hard on this, and it's connectable with third-party tools. We went with that new brick to ship owners, to architects, and we asked them about their problematics, and we wanted to see which problematic we could solve with our new brick. And their question were, which technology is the best for my fleet? Or, that's a great technology, great, uh, but what's going to be my return on investment? Okay, great, uh, wind assistance seems awesome, but I need to keep my ETAs. What's going to be my actual consumption on my routes? But also, my future ship is running on LNG, on fuel oil and on with wings, for example, what's going to be the energy mix? And when do I know which one to use? So what's a digital twin? How do you get from an existing ship to a digital version? And most importantly, how do you get from the digital version to a new more efficient ship. It's a combination of mathematical models all function of each other, each other's. 
For example, you can have the drag of the hull, that's a model. The consumption of your engine, the costs of your fuel, the trim added resistance, the effect of heel and leeway on, on consumption. So how do you create a model? You collect data, we talked about that earlier today. You sort them out, you clean them, you arrange them, you get these data from sensors on board, but also from simulation. They can be basic inputs, such as fuel consumptions, RPMs, headings, environmental conditions. Two most specific ones, lift coefficient of a sail, interaction between both your sails or mul multiple sail, and effect of leeway on propellers effici efficiency, etc. The screenshot you can see here is just a 3D representation of a very, very precise container ships model and twin that integrates quantity resistance function of drafts, of drafts, sorry, uh, trim, etc. Superstructure aerodynamic model added resistance in wave, propeller RPM, torque, consumption, of course, cost of fuel, leeway effect on the propeller, heel effect on the propeller, fouling, etc. And it was built from raw data from the ship and from simulation. It was validated by CFD simulation. So you can have your ship's model and play models. Uh, you can add different models of innovative sol solution on it. This is an example of wind assistance propulsion. But if you have a sh your ship's twin and the performance curves of your new fuel, you can run simulation on your fleet, on your common routes, with your required ETAs, with your fuel economics, and get the expected efficiency out of that. So to sum up, the digital version of a ship is taking all its elements into account, what it's made of, hull, superstructure, engine, propeller, battery, etc., and its parametrics, routes, ETAs, environment, operational constraints, availability of energy on different ports, etc. And what you get out of it is critical information both for your company and for your captains to help you make the right decision. Of course, you have reports, of course, you have analytics, but because this software was built by people that knew how to make great software, you can also obviously plug it in to all your third party tools, fleet center, routing tools, data lakes of your engines, manufacturers, etc. So we used efficient ship for our speed record problem problematics, but also for a dozen clients that are now using themselves the SaaS platform. They can simulate scenarios, sharpen their decisions, and they're able to compare their, the technical uh, advancements of, your, of their fleet, calculate ship range, etc., and plan their energy mix. I'm gonna give you two examples. The first one, you might have guessed from the pictures before, comes from a study that CMA CGM is running on our tool. And they want to compare the different wind assistance solution uh, uh, that are available on the market. They're hoping to gain up to 20% gain on some of their routes. They are using efficient ship to model their fleets to model the solution and they are able to run comparison, size the wind assistance solution to reach their targets and to simulate all of this on their routes. Interestingly enough, during 
their study before modeling the wind assistant solution. They only with the ship's model very well calibrated, they have spotted out a few parameters that they could easily tune to gain some precious percentage without even adding any anything on board, just by having a correct and validated digital twin of their ship. Another example come from a state-of-the-art shipyard who, have, who, has a, who had a problematic on their uh, crew transfer vessel. It was not performant enough. And they ran an efficient ship-centered study and they were able to design an optimized and safe foiling system that came up to 25% of their energy consumption on th at their cruising speed. And they were able to deliver to the market a market-breaking product. So thanks a lot for listening. That's our main product, Efficient Ship. It's available right now. Uh, I hope it's gonna reach your team and help you design and operate efficient ships by the future. Some people are already doing it and they're happy about it. I'm here with uh, Florent and Yves and we can answer all your questions. And we're very happy to talk more about our Moonshot, the, the products, and also, of course, about your problematics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivier, for this very detailed presentation. It was very interesting. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, anybody looking for, for a bit more information? I, mean, I think it's, it's incredibly useful to be able to model these ships and to know exactly what, uh, what you're dealing with, and certainly for a ship owner uh, in terms of their ve current vessels, but also designing future vessels, this is, must be invaluable. Um, do we have any questions? you have a hungry audience. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, on, that, uh, on that note, if you could please also join me in thanking Olivier. <laughs> so that does bring us up to our lunch break now. And this morning we've had a lot of different interesting presentations looking at new technologies. This afternoon we also have some very interesting presentations. Um, and so, as I explained, we'll be looking at regulations at the first part of the afternoon and looking at some very, very important topics there. And we've heard yesterday that this is going to be a large part of our decision making going forward. Where do the regulations take us? What do we have to do and what do we have to comply with? So that should be some very interesting discussions uh, and panel discussions. And then after the coffee break this afternoon, we'll then have a presentation looking at the crew's health. The crew is often overlooked on these vessels. We spend a lot of time talking about the econo economics of the vessels. We talk about efficiencies, we talk about the digital systems, but we don't always spend the time talking about the crew on board of the vessel. And over the last year and a half, we think that we've had a difficult time with COVID, with being confined at home. Certainly ships, crew on board of ships have had a very, very, very difficult time. Some of them not being able to be changed for over a year. And so it's a very important issue. And so we're very lucky to have Vladimir from SGS who's going to talk to us about that. And then at the end of the afternoon, we have a panel looking at the funding of all of these projects. And again, that is going to be vital going forward because if there's one thing we've agreed to over today and yesterday, it's there's going to be a lot of cost of all of these different initiatives. And so it's very, very important. So on that, break, on that note, we do have our lunch break now. I wish you all a very, very pleasant lunch. And we start again at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>